Good morning, Mike. You are the first victim. <laughs> Matt's maker space is a right on his tail. Keeping your victims happy today. I finished the adjustable dumbbell and it came out great. I haven't decided if I'm going to make the extra one a thin handle or a thick handle. But I, I finished the knurled caps. And they are deeper so they will actually clamp together the entire unit. It's not watertight anymore but that's okay. We don't need watertight. We're using sand. Well, I, mean, I, even, I was even able to print these at the one millimeter nozzle and they printed fine. Although, I could probably make these a lot lighter if I print them with a smaller nozzle. But they're only 9 grams each. It's not that much. There is 12 of them, though. But now these are capable of um, going on far enough to actually clamp to the frame. So, is this. Well, that is an adjustable dumbbell. And this is all nice and rigid, all tight. Nothing here wiggles or moves because these are able to actually clamp the dumbbell shape to the frame. I made this center handle a little thinner. Basically, it's the same thing, but without the bulbous shape. So it's a little easier to grab a hold of. And there's less interference with your hand and the outside ones. One of the things I want to, um, the total is, um, it'll be just over five pounds total. You fill everything up. So each of these will weigh approximately one pound when filled with the band. Um, with the 18 grams from the caps, it'll probably be pretty close to a pound. It's, um, I think I need 300,000 cubic millimeters equal one pound. And these will hold or have an area of, 291,000 cubic millimeters, so pretty darn close. Close enough for government work. <laughs> no one's going to care, you know, if it's if it's 0.95 pounds. So um, the way to work is um, you have your dumbbell. First of all, you could just use one of these. That's your one pound. When you start off, you just hold one of these in your hand. You can hold one in each hand, and you have your one pound weight. When you're ready to go to two pounds. Um, it's a bit annoying to have to take it apart and put it together, but you only have to do it once for each weight class because usually when you go from one to two pounds, you're never going to go back to one pound again because now you're at two pounds. Um, this is for physical therapy. You know, obviously, people who are exercising in fitness people, they're going to be using more than five pounds. This is mostly for physical therapy type people. Who, um, you know, they're doing one, two, three pounds because that's what they can do. You know, we're talking, you know, People who are injured, people who are 80 years old, or people you see at a physical therapy center. So the idea is you would put an empty handle in the middle here, and then you do one tube on each side. Now you're at two pounds. Well, it's a little over two pounds, actually, um, because the entire thing weighs about a pound. Um, you got 200 grams for that, and each of these is 40 grams plus 18 grams. Hello, Welfare God. Um, one thing I don't like is that um, these interfere with each other. Although that might be largely due to my large hands. But I noticed that I got to be careful when I put these on. Because it's very easy to rack your knuckles against the one next to it. So I might actually smooth out this texture a little bit. So that um, it'll, be a, it'll be a little less grippy. But also um, less likely to tear apart your knuckles. Do this. See how, see how my knuckles crash into the one next to it? I'm a little worried about that. I'm not worried about it for me, but you know, you hand this to an you know 80-year-old invalid person who's trying to get better, and that might be an issue. But anyway, um the only thing I haven't figured out yet that there's no way to make it modular without removing all five. You have to remove all five in order to make any changes. 
You don't have to remove the other side. You gotta remove all five because the whole plate has to come off. And I haven't figured out a way to, to do it yet without having to remove all five and also without making it overly complex. So that five pieces comes off and now the entire plate comes off. And now you have access to whatever you want to change. Um, now when you fill these with sand, what we'll do, the one end is going to be sealed, the other end is going to be open, you fill it with sand, take a little hot glue and just put a little hot glue in the end there, and now the sand never has, you never have to worry about them unscrewing a cap and the sand coming out. Uh, I would take like a little toilet paper, stuff it in there, hot glue, and that will seal it up on this end so that you don't have to worry about sand draining out. But then you would just change out these pieces for whatever you want. So you would use um, just the center one, for example, would be a little over a pound. Then when you want it to go up to two pounds, you'd make the center one empty. You'd swap this out with an empty one. And then you'd do two cross-posing ones. And that would be like two and a quarter pounds, two and a half pounds. And then when you're ready to go to three, you just replace the center one with a filled one. And now you have a little over three pounds. When you're ready to go to four... The center one becomes empty again, and you do four on the ends that are filled. This also allows it to stay balanced. I mean, you could put one, you could put two on the end, but now it's heavier on one side than the other side. So by doing it in cross pattern in the outside, everything stays balanced. So this whole thing stays even and balanced. And then when you want to go to the maximum, you fill all five. So you replace them with five filled ones. And when you're done making your changes, your cap goes on. Then you just start threading your caps on. The, the concave surface in there, that beveled edge in there, is actually the same exact beveled edge that's on the piece itself. So that when these mate together, it's actually a perfect mating. There's no wiggle. Um, so it's maximum surface area, which should spread the load. I still have not done drop testing. So I gotta do some drop testing to see how well this takes being dropped on the floor. But the objective at this point is to make it so that no tools are required. Technically, you don't need to hot glue the ends. That's just a convenience thing. Um, I might even make a, a little 3D printed cup that friction fits in there, like a little cylinder. that will friction fit into the end to seal the sand in there. So you don't even, have, you don't even need glue if you don't want to. But that, at that point, it's easier just to use glue to um, seal up the end of it. But yeah, that came out really nice. I'm really pleased. Nice and compact. It's not too big. Um, these are about 90 grams a piece. These are about 42 grams a piece, if I remember right. These are 9 grams a piece, each cap. Um, and you know something? If a person is going to be using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle to print this, it wouldn't be that hard to make a lighter cap have um over two millimeters of room to play with so i could take um like 70 percent off the diameter of this cap and still have a multi-wall print i might do that but i'm also going to knock down the edges a little bit i have that little knurling pattern on there go for grip but i think i'm going to knock down flatten it a little bit so it's not as pointy spiky these are already flat, but with the um, one millimeter nozzle, they stick out a bit. Um, most of them aren't sharp. It must be um, filament stretching between parts. You know, you have that little wisp of filament. And it must be always at the same spot, and it makes certain parts like that part right there. I'm betting that's all that jaggedness is probably where the nozzle stopped and moved to the next part. And so it dragged a little bit of filament with it. You end up with these spikies. Just changing to random might fix that. Then the spikies will spread around. But uh, it might be easier just to knock that down a little bit with a you know, knife. Something tool. See how hard that is.
Oh, yeah, it's not hard. Oh, that's easy. That was really easy. Yeah, so just knock them down. But I'm pleased with how that came out. It really came out nice. My biggest concern is um, I now need to print these parts using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. Um, with the exception of the, well, all of these are printed in vase mode. And part of the reason for that is to keep it, keep it light. I uh, want it to be as light as possible so it used as little plastic as possible. Um, you should be able to print two of these per roll of filament. Which means it'll cost you about five bucks to print one of these. You buy a ten dollar roll of PETG, eleven dollar roll of PETG, and it's going to use about five bucks worth of plastic. I'd like to try to get that down to four dollars because it also needs about one dollars worth of um, sand. Now, some places like out here, you can just go outside and get the sand. And um, you know, if you live in a shore state, um, you know, New Jersey. The states below it, or the desert states, you could just go outside and get sand and fill it up. Although, sand you find outside probably does not have the same density as the sand you buy in a store. The sand you buy in a store is going to be much more fine-grained, and it will pack much tighter, so your density will be higher. But again, the difference is going to be negligible. No one cares if your weight is you know, 0.9 pounds or 1.2 pounds. No one cares doesn't matter the whole point is you start with a lightweight and you keep adding to it until you get to the five or six pounds so this probably is going to you'll probably be able to if you if you put a bigger handle in the middle instead of the thin handle um you could probably push close to six pounds with this with the um with them all full <sighs> I can lighten it up. I don't know how much I can lighten this up. This band is 10 millimeters. And 10 millimeters seems about right for force distribution. Um, right now, the, it's, it's it's like 12 millimeters of, um, of a section of the cone that it's mating with. And that, that's a good distribution of mass. Um, with the one millimeter nozzle, this bracket's basically indestructible. I mean, I bent it almost as hard as I could, and it did not break. Um, these would break if you squeeze. If you nailed these hard enough, they'd probably break. Although the sand will probably help. It would be like a dead blow hammer. Once these are filled with sand, it's going to be a lot like a dead blow hammer. But we'll see how that goes. Um, I think I think it was right to make this one thinner. I can even go thinner if I want. I can have a concave surface come back down. But I think that's I think that's small enough for people to I can wrap my fingers fully around it. So I think that's small enough for um most people to be able to hang on to. I think this was pushing it. I think that's a little on the thick side, you know, especially for older, frailer people to grip onto it, but I, I think that'll be okay. I'll have to take it over to the um to the um therapy center. And, you know, just say, hey, you know, use this for a week and see how you like it. You know, I'll print them up a few copies. Um, for a therapy center, I can even um, um, pre-do it at the right size. So I can give them, like, a couple of different sets. So they'll, they'll already have a set so they don't have to take it apart and put it together. That would have been the other nice thing about water, that you could just adjust how much water's in there. Very easy to adjust. But water would require this to be 66% larger. So this whole thing would have to be much bigger. Or I would have to add more tubes. Um, so for example, I could add another a, a set of tubes here, and then water might become practical. But the problem with water is that um, if you get so much as a crack, it's gonna oh. leak. Well, if you just crack the end of that tube, sand in it, nothing's coming out unless you actually break it. Sand is a little less messy, although water will dry out. What are you doing? 
I see you. Um, my very first one is still holding water. It's still watertight, so that's good. Problem there. I don't know what I would do with that, but it's interesting that it can. <laughs> um, it'd be interesting to see if it holds gasoline. That might not be safe. Even if the gasoline doesn't eat the plastic, if um, that becomes compromised, now you have gas leaking. That's no good. But um, like when I had my motorcycle, I always had a little container, like a quarter gallon of gas in it underneath my seat. So if I ever ran out of gas, I'd had my little emergency supply of gas. That's a motorcycle. That's more than enough to get you anywhere. You know, to a gas station. But um, in a car, you need quite a bit more. If you if you if your car ran out, that might actually not be enough to get the car started. Because there's a dead zone at the bottom of the tank, depending on how the car is tilted or whatever. You really need at least a gallon. Um, I also beveled the edge so that when these print, you don't have that sharp edge. So these edges are nice. Uh, I think I will knock down these peaks a little bit just to make that a little flatter. Um, I'd like to try to make these a little bit thinner if I can. Um, I think I can maybe knock a millimeter off and still be able to make two perimeters. With a one millimeter nozzle, that's enough. But um, if I can knock some mass off of these things, that would be a good thing. I wonder how much, like, do I have more space in these than I need? Oh, yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, that's way more space than I need. You see there? I can knock five millimeters off of that. I just might do that. That would knock maybe half a gram off of each one, maybe a gram. Okay, so I got a lot of dead space there. I had to have enough dead space to make sure these would actually compress. So there'll be no jiggle. But I overdid it. That's more dead space than I need. I can't think of an easy way to avoid the knuckle busting. Oh, you know, where your knuckles hit that. I can't think of an easy way to get rid of that. <coughs> <coughs> I mean, sure, I could make this wishbone wider. You know, you, you don't knuckle bust this one. This one, you got clearance all around. Um, the problem is then you would, um, the one of the, I want to also make this cheap and easy for people to print. If it's complicated, people aren't going to do it. Um, yeah, um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to use bottle caps. So you didn't have to print you know, 16 of these or 14, 12, I'm sorry. You need to print 12 of these. You need five here, five here, plus your spare. So it's 12 caps that you need to print. Which is not that bad, but it's still, if I can reduce the part count, I'd like to. Now, something I... Something I could do that might be interesting. I don't know if it's worth it or not. I like the modularity. The nice thing about being modular, it's it's nice to be modular. Um, it would also eliminate the need to have glue in the end of one of the bottles. With that's an interesting idea. Do I want to do that? I could reduce the size of these caps and get rid of the knurling altogether and then make these caps a built-in part of one of the wishbones. So the caps would not be caps. Only this side would have caps. This wish, one wishbone would print like it does now. The other wishbone would print with threads built in. So it would have these, it would have short little caps built into the end of it. And, um... <clears throat> What you would do is when you took off one end, each of these would then what you would do is you would take open end and you would thread it into the wishbone. And these would be just threaded right in. By threading that into the wishbone, you eliminate the issue of the sand coming off if you accidentally remove the gap. 
because the only cap you can remove is the end that's sealed. Um, I might have to test that. I might have to test that. That would reduce the part count by five. You eliminate five parts. Now you don't have to print five caps. Ooh, interesting. And then if you didn't print the caps for the spare, you're eliminating seven parts. You'd only have to print five caps. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think about that. Huh. But only one end would have caps. The other end, the tubes themselves, would thread into the, the wishbone. The dog bone. Yeah, I think that might actually work. I gotta think about that. So this end would come off, and this one would be just the wishbone, and the other wishbone, these caps would be a actually printed with the wishbone, which would allow me to greatly reduce how much plastic they needed. And then what you would do is you would literally just thread off one of these caps. So the bottle itself would unthread like that. And the cap would stay as part of the um the other frame. And you would just thread it into the frame just like that. And you would just turn it until it's tight so it didn't wiggle anymore. And then, um, that's it. This end would be sealed, so when you remove the cap, you wouldn't have to worry about anything spilling out. Then you would just unthread the bottles. Hmm. Now, the only problem with that is gripping the bottles. I mean, is that enough surface area? It's enough surface area for me. Yeah, I can just grab that bottle and unthread it just like that. But what about a, um, a disabled person? How difficult would it be for them to do that? Um, I guess if you work the threads a couple times so the threads are smooth, maybe increase the tolerance a little bit on the threads so that um, it didn't take as much force. But yeah, and you just thread the bottles into one end. You wouldn't have to remove all these caps because these caps would be a permanent part of it. And then you'd only have to do this end. You know, you put your end on and then tap it. In fact, in fact, oh, why didn't I think of that? I could do the whole thing with one cap. Why didn't I think of that? I could make this end of the dumbbell the same as this end, you know, with built-in caps, except the caps would be fake. The caps would be... Hey, Fernando. The, uh, the caps would be fake. They would just be there for decoration, so the both ends look the same. But there'd be no threads. Because this is tight enough with just the one. This doesn't do any wiggling. No, that's, that, that feels great. Now, I can force these ends out a little bit like that, but that's me forcing them. But um, you could tighten just the center cap, and this whole thing would hold together just fine. Oh, that makes it so much easier. Now, the only bad part of that <coughs> is that um, having caps adds compression. These are being compressed together, which unifies the structure it makes it, it turns it more into a unified structure um yes it's all in tinkercad oh man i'm actually thinking about making the wishbones a little bit thicker if I made the wishbones a little bit thicker, 
Um, I wouldn't need much in the way of caps at all on this end, these pieces, because you know, this could be capped off down here. Um, so it would, just, it would just stick there like that. Oh, man, that is such a good idea. But would it be strong enough? It would require that they tighten that enough. But the advantages are huge. Because now when you want to adjust how much is on here, first of all, you got, you're got you printing a lot less plastic. So um, you're printing almost 100 grams less plastic. I would love to get down to three per spool. I would love to get these down to, um, you know, like... 340 grams, you could print three sets per spool of filament. That would be fantastic. Oh, man, that is such a good idea. But would it be enough? Because now the only thing holding this together is one cap. I mean, these sides would be threaded, but on this side, it would only be one cap holding it together. And one of the advantages of multi-caps is that you get that distribution of force. So now when this hits the ground, if somebody drops this, all five connections are adding to its rigidity and its shock distribution. But if I had one cap, now all of the strength would basically be on this one connection here. It's a good connection, it's a strong connection, but is it enough? Oh, I don't know. That would work so damn well. Because now to adjust it, you would only have to remove the one. And then this whole thing would just come off. And then you just unthread whatever you need to thread and rethread whatever you need to thread. And you put that back on again. And you only need one cap in the middle. Oh, that is such a good idea. Maybe I'll do you know, see him. You see, here's the advantage of 3D printing. If you want 10 different versions of something, you can have 10 different versions of something. <laughs> I could just, I could release both. I could release the, 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 the hyper strong version or the hyper efficient version. You know, the one with the 10 caps is, you know, maximum configurability and maximum strength. Um, and the one with a single threaded cap is going to be the most efficient. Hey, Colin. Yeah, I remember when it was called 3D Studio. I think I still have a copy of 3D Studio somewhere. Well, probably got thrown away in Pennsylvania. Something I probably didn't keep. Like, I, I didn't keep my Autodesk 11 boxes either. <laughs> I still had my boxes for Autodesk, AutoCAD 11. This is, this is rigid. This is strong. Like, that's going nowhere. Um, and I like that. But I don't like how much of a pain in the butt it is to adjust it. In fact, if I wanted to go really hyper-efficient, I can get rid of these four caps, too. And then it would just be the center two sets of threads holding everything together. That would really lighten things up. No, no, just one end. That was actually a problem we had originally. Um, I print it with one end closed. So, well, originally these were going to hold water, and you know, I can make them watertight, but water is 66% less dense than sand. The sand allows me to make the whole thing a whole lot smaller. Um, but the bottom layers also give you better bed adhesion. You print like this. So um, I found out that the, the soda bottle caps have a ridge on the inside, and that ridge forms a shape like this. 
and that shape is what seals on the bottle so that when you filled in one end the cap wouldn't go on so you see when i put the cap on it just popped off so it just keeps popping off there's only one thread's engaging and that's because that that little ridge you can see in there see that ring inside there that's a raised ridge that ridge is hitting the filled in area normally that ridge would actually go inside the bottle you can see on this end so the bottle cap fits perfect no problem so this would actually be watertight um but that would mean i'd have to get rid of that and that's no good because now you only have a single ring holding that part on the print bed i mean mine would have no problem printing that but a lot of people would have a problem printing that um but since we're going with sand we no longer need watertight and so i just print my own caps the other problem with the bottle caps is that um in order for this structure to go together I need some sort of I need some compression otherwise these end caps are loose and the I would have to um fine tune the design of this end cap to the nth degree I would probably have to print it 10 times to get it exactly right so that when this cap tightened down it compressed the part and then on top of that um, it's going to be different for every bottle cap because every bottle cap is just a hair different they're just slightly different like this one here is slightly different from that one there and um so it was easier to make my own bottle cap that had more threads than i need so this is this has a bunch of empty space on the top here which i'm going to fine tune to reduce the amount of plastic it requires but um that extra space means i can compress this down and now this entire structure is being compressed together so it's really really rigid and strong you know you, you can't twist it um but damn it to hell if i if i my my concern is that this here will eventually bow if i don't cap the ends i know pla would definitely pla would but PTG, does it have that same problem? Well, that's actually the idea we just I just came up with a few minutes ago, right before you logged in. I thought of um, building the caps directly into the end piece itself, which would make them a whole lot smaller. You need a whole lot less plastic. And then the tubes would thread right in, which would make this a lot easier to adjust. Now, there's a, there's a, there are problems with that. Um, one of the reasons these caps are big, fat, meaty caps is so that people who don't, these are for, these are for physical, these are for physical therapy, um, and these are people who usually have grip problems, you know, they have issues with grip, so the nice thing about the big, fat, meaty caps is that it's something that they can grip, although you gotta watch out for knuckle busting, that one there is close enough to bust your knuckles, um, so the question is, Will a person who has grip issues be able to, um, if this is threaded into the end, will they have enough grip on this to be able to unscrew it? Um, so that's something I'll have to test. Um, basically, have you know, have them have their patient um, unscrew one of these. And um, and then say, okay, now hold on to the cap, and now try unscrewing it by the bottle, and they do it. If they can successfully do it. Now, the advantage is more surface area. You have more of the bottle to grab, although maybe not when the bottles are close together like this. Um, but, you know, more surface area. But are they strong enough to be able to unthread the cap? Now, once you break it, then it's, then it's just going to unscrew pretty easily. Um, so that it might require whoever makes these to um, either tune their flow rate tolerance so that the cap don't have a lot of crap inside um, so that the threads are nice and smooth. Or uh, they might, uh, oh my God. They might um, just have to work the threads a little bit. So just put it together tight and then just do this. And just keep doing this, you know, until it's um, it's um, 
it's no longer too tight for the patient to do. So now, now it's pretty, it's relatively loose. Because um, those threads are pretty messy in there. I might have to design my own threads one day, clean them up a little bit, make them 3D printing friendly. Because um, the PET cap threads aren't 3D printing friendly, at least with a one millimeter nozzle. But they worked. So, you know, because this, this worked perfectly. But I had to I had to modify these threads. There were um there were hard 90 degree overhangs on the top and bottom of these threads that I had to get rid of or this wouldn't print properly. It would have errors and it would not be watertight. So I already modified this part to be um 3D printing friendly. Um so it might not be that hard to modify the cap um to be a little bit more 3D printing friendly. Sometimes just getting the the threads inside, you know, they come to a point like this. Sometimes just knocking down the point with a little tiny flat is enough. Sometimes that's enough to give it enough meat. Um, more friendly to the 3D printing process. You just gotta watch you don't knock it down too much because otherwise you um because you have your thread sticking out on here and you have your threads on here and they have to mesh. And if you knock down your threads, you also knock down how much meat you have for those threads to mesh. And if you knock down too much meat, you jump threads. Now the plastic itself could distort and jump the threads. That's ex actually exactly what's happening here when you put the cap on. The cap itself is, is being bowed out and it jumps. The cap pops off because it hasn't engaged enough of the threads to have strength yet. So it's only engaged one set of threads. So when that inner ring hits the top of the, the printed surface there that's not supposed to be there, um, the cap actually bows out and the threads pop, pops off. And then I found one that didn't. I'm guessing it was a little more rigid than the other ones. They all do it. That one actually went on good. Oh, yes. The some of the caps for soda bottles, uh, um, they don't have, this here is a one piece cap. The whole cap is one piece, and it's using that inner ring and that outer ring to create a hook interface that goes into the bottle. So part of the cap is inside the bottle, part of the cap is outside the bottle, and when they compress together, when you tighten them, they compress and form a seal. Um, the sum of the newer caps, which I don't like, they don't work as well, although they work better for 3D printing, um, they don't have that ridge inside. Instead, they have a little blue, that little piece of blue thing in there. You can barely see it here. That's it. That dark color cap inside there. That's a separate piece of plastic inside the cap. And that does not have that ridge. So that this one is able to thread onto the sealed end of my um, units without a problem. Now, the problem with using bottle caps would solve a lot of problems. But the bottle caps have their own problems. I'll show you. I put it all back together again? Yes, I did. I'll show you here. See? I put the bottle cap on. You see the bottle cap doesn't touch. There's a gap. The gap there. So I'd have to fine-tune this design to get rid of that gap. And then that would only work for the one cap. Because a different cap will have a different gap. Well, we can't do that. You can't you can't just make a 45 degree edge for the threads. That's not gonna work. Um that'll work if you're making your own cap. If you're making your own threads, if you're doing everything yourself, that'll work great. As a matter of fact, the best thread design I've come up with yet is this one. This is my thread design. You can, well, you can barely see it, but you can see the threads have a better than 45 degree angle and a flat edge on the top here. And so they print real nice. And I use surface area to make up for the difference. So these parts thread together really, really nicely. And you can see this is what I have here. So this part, you can see the threads real nice. 
because these threads are 100% 3D printing compatible, um, there's no slop. You see there's like almost, look at that, barely any play when you partially thread it. And, um, um, and there's no hairs, there's no misplaced filament. And these are completely, um, thank you, Colin. Um, these are completely vase mode compatible. So that's all printed in vase mode. That's all printed in vase mode. Um, so these threads go together. You have to find the ends, the start and end points. But once you get the threads in there, they thread together really nice and they tighten up really nice. Um, that's if, if you're designing your own threads. You can do that. But um, it's too late for me to go that route because I'm not going to redesign from scratch. And I made these originally for bottle caps. So that's kind of what I'm stuck with. Also one? Yeah, that also has the blue thing inside. Um, but also, these threads are not good for small threaded objects. Um, it's too small. The, the size of these details gets too small when you shrink it down. I can get down to about 30 millimeters and it's good. But any smaller than that and they start to get iffy. Um, so when you're, when you're dealing with little stuff like this, you're going to have sharp edges. The flat part. Oh, the flat part of the thread? Well, yeah, the, the, the point of the flat part of the thread is to avoid this. It's to avoid printing a knife edge. Because printing knife edges never works well. Uh, when you print a knife edge, you're basically printing an overhang. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Either which way, you end up with a really sloppy... You can't even see that. I don't have a light to show you. My phone probably doesn't work. So... You end up with some really sloppy threads in there. Um, that's the nature of the knife edge. You have your 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 thin um, threads by putting that little tiny flat surface. That flat surface only needs to be 0.4 millimeters thick, two layers. But just by having that flat surface, you're now um you're. you're it's a, it's, a, it's a shape instead of an edge. And shapes are strong, edges are weak. Um, so this has lots of edges. This has all shapes. Now the downfall is it's hard to make this really small. So for me to use these threads on something this small, it's difficult. If it doesn't print right, you don't get the tolerances right. Because these, the tolerances have to be right. Otherwise, you can see my, my threads are not very thick. See? They don't stick out very far. Right? So the interface needs to be good. Um, if the interface is not good, this part will just pop out. It'll jump threads. Um, the knife edge threads gives you lots of wiggle room. You know, you, you ever put a cap on something and look how much it wiggles? Look, look, how, much, look how much play that cap has. Look at that. Look at, look at that incredible amount of play that cap has. Yet, when you tighten it down, it's fine. Because it's using many threads, and it's compressing the plastic. So when you, when, you, when, you, when you do that, you can get away with a tremendous amount of wiggle room that you can't get away with in a normal part. You see, when I do my part, when I thread my part in, there's only um, one, two, three threads for the whole entire thing. But you see here, there's very, very little wiggle room. It's just got the tiniest bit of wiggle. And that is your tolerance. Right? But that tolerance is much smaller than the depth of my threads. Now when you tighten it, of course, there's no wiggle room at all. My threads aren't perfect. I sometimes, like this here, you can see this part is not going in straight. The, the, the shoulder here is actually tilted a little bit. And under the right conditions, you can really notice that. I haven't figured out how to fix that yet. It's a flaw in my interface. When the um, is when you have the part out like this, it's straight. But when the part hits the other end and cinches, you know, when you compress, it tilts. And that's a, that's a flaw in my thread design, and, and probably a flaw in this part here, in the chamfer that interfaces with the surface inside the model here. Um, 
I still gotta figure that out because I'm not an expert on threads. Um, my threads are manually made. I don't I don't have a thread generator. I, I manually made those threads by modifying the existing set of threads. And I just kept modifying and modifying and modifying until I got what I want. <laughs> so there's probably plenty of errors there. Plenty of issues built in. Oh, man. I hate this chair. It's just a hair too low. I need this chair to be like four inches taller. Oh, Jesus, let me into the damn site. What the heck? Shout out to Colin. Got 58 bucks in PayPal. Thank you, Colin. I really appreciate that. Hey, 3D Medic. I'm trying to... <laughs> <laughs> I found out the hard way the electric company has no tolerance for missing a payment. <laughs> I had changed my um, credit card that I was using to pay my electric bill, and I forgot to tick the auto payment thing. So when you change the credit card, it disables automatic payment. You have to re-enable by ticking the box. Well, I didn't tick the box, so it didn't auto pay. And um, uh, they came out yesterday to disconnect the power. <laughs> <laughs> 20 days after the bill was due, they were out to disconnect the power. He was cool. He let me log in and click pay. And I explained I changed the credit card number and the auto payment must not be enabled. Fixed it right away. But yeah, that no tolerance there. Jesus. <laughs> well, I guess when you live in an, an impoverished area, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you if you got a person who can't afford a $200 bill, they're probably not going to be able to afford a $400 bill next month. So cut it off now before... You know, the bill gets huge and um yeah what are you gonna do paid it no problem the um but i got a, i wanted to go see the um the solar eclipse and um i i can't do it i just it's too far away i'd have to drive out to austin texas well, the right below Austin, Texas. Um, it would it'd be a, it'd be a single day trip. Drive out, get the pictures, drive back. But um, I don't have the money for the fuel, and I don't have the money for if something happens, the car breaks down. I'm outside of AAA range. AAA max is 200 miles. So anything within 200 miles, I'm golden. You know, because then AAA just bring me home. I'll still have a broken car, but at least the car will be at the house, and not you know getting auctioned off somewhere because I had to abandon it. <laughs> that would suck. Um, but, um, yeah, so I'm not going to go to that, especially because I, I, need, I need to have the fuel money to go to Rocky Mountain Rep Rep. So that's more important, so I'm going to go to that. Um, I'll have this there for people to check out. As well as my cinder block. I'm bringing my cinder block. I just like my cinder block. I don't know why. <laughs> I just, just printing a cinder block was cool. It's just, it's dumb, but it's cool. But yeah, this is looking good. Now the question is, um, here's my issue. This wouldn't the idea to make this with less parts. I can do this with one single screw. I can build the threads into this part here, design it right into it. And then I could just have the one cap on here. As long as you use the sealed ends, as long as you make sure the sealed ends of the tube are what stick out here. That's the, that way it's supposed to be this way. So as long as you make sure the sealed ends stick up, then um, you don't have to worry about having a cap on this end. They can just stick out. Um, I can even make them shorter and get rid of them. Um, which would make this a little bit easier to print. Because this end doesn't need threads at all. I could just have it stop right here and be a flat surface. Because it's just going to interface with this. It doesn't need to be... Um, 
doesn't have to be designed to um as long as those nubs just go over the soda caps on the bottles it should be good i don't understand what that means uh the problem with the soda caps i'll explain again um hang on so Okay, soda cap. Okay, in your head, we're going to cut the soda cap in half. Okay, so we're going to have a cross section of the soda cap. So, zip, cut in half, and we're now looking at a cross section of the soda cap. The cross section of the soda cap looks like this. Okay, so this is the threads. So my palms are the threads, and that's what threads onto the cap. Okay, this is the cross section of the soda cap. You might be thinking, wait a minute, you know, what's this? What's this part here? Well, that is a second ring on the inside of the cap, right? So the cap is actually, if you take a sliver cross section of the cap, it's a J shape. It looks like this. Now, the reason that's there is that if this is your soda bottle cross section, and we put the cross section of the cap over the soda bottle, as the cap threads down, it actually does this. So the cap is actually engaging both the inside and the outside of the soda bottle that is it is hard for me to show you but that is that you can just see it that little ring inside there okay that's this part that's the j part of the soda bottle cap not a cap like this okay most caps that you see designed they're like this cross section and they just thread down until they're tight well soda bottles have to not only be watertight but they have to hold at least three atmospheres of pressure because that's how much pressure the CO2 inside the bottle is capable of exerting against the cap, three atmospheres. So it has this seal inside. Well, that seal goes inside the bottle. But if the bottle is sealed, it can't go inside because the end of the bottle is sealed. Um, so the reason I can't use the soda caps is because I would have to make this an open end. And I could do that, but now it's going to be a lot harder to print this. <laughs> Without that bottom layer, there's, there's only a ring holding that entire thing on. And people who have bed adhesion problems, yeah, that's just going to knock over. The other problem is um, these caps are... These caps are profit-optimized. So they have, if you look at a cap from 20 years ago, it's very different from the caps today. Um, yeah, that's how they form the seal. Now, some caps are different. These, we actually consider these to be worse. You notice that sodas go flatter faster lately? That's because they have these caps. They don't, hold, they don't hold as well. So this cap is a flat cap like this. Okay? And it has a, a rubber seal on the inside to produce the seal between the cap and the bottle. That's what that little blue thing inside there is. There's a little blue. Can I get it out? Let's see if I can get it out. I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's welded place. I don't think it'll come out. No, it's welded in there. I think it's sonically welded to the cap on the inside. But if you, if you look at one of the other caps, you notice there's a, a little blue disc inside, and that blue disc is actually a different piece of plastic that produces a seal, but there's no J-Ridge. So that's why this cap will not work on this. It just, see how it just pops? See, it just pops. Because that, that J-hook inside is hitting the top of the cap and not allowing it to thread. This one doesn't have that, so it threads all the way on. Now, the other problem I have is that the caps are a little bit different. And the caps are also flexible. Now, these are HDPE, so they're pretty darn flexible, which is good for sealing against a rigid surface, like a really thick end of a bottle. Not so good when you're trying to use it as a, a compression part to hold things together. So when I do this, I'll show you what I do. Um, I'm trying to avoid using TPU because TPU is harder to print and more expensive. TPU, remember, the, the, the purpose of this project is um, 
these are this is not for me i'm going to use these because i need it too but the purpose of going all out like this is not for me i could just spend 12 bucks and buy a couple of weights and you know because i don't I could, there's ways i can finagle it you go to five and below and you can get them pretty cheap um but you know a weight set's going to cost you about um 40 bucks 30 to 40 dollars there are ways to do it cheaper so you can buy a couple of key sizes at five and below and then just buy one set so instead of having two you'd have one you'd have to do one hand and then you have to swap it to the other hand do the other hand by having two of these you can do two at once um the um the purpose of this is to make a very low cost adjustable dumbbell set for people who are in physical therapy um, and these are usually people who are poor so they are either on a fixed income social security or something like that or their social security disability income or they just don't have a lot of money and this will allow them to have a, a pretty nice dumbbell set for very cheap this would also allow people to donate dumbbell sets i i should be able to get the price to make one of these under five bucks including the sand right now we're a little over that i think i can fine tune it and get it down below that price my objective is um, 340 grams, roughly. If I can get this down to about 340 grams, then you'll be able to make a set of three of these with one kilogram of plastic. You can buy a kilogram of PETG for $11. So that means um, $3.60 in plastic, roughly. So less than $4 in plastic. Um, the print time, you're probably looking at about we're going to ignore that, but you're probably looking at about 50 to 50 cents to a dollar in electricity to print. I'd have to do the math on that. Um, it depends. There's so many variables on that. Well, the problem is even the Diet Coke bottles change from location to location. And also, I, I don't want the design to be dependent on what they have. So I came up with a better idea. <laughs> Don't use any caps at all. <laughs> Get rid of all the caps, um, except for one. So the design will be this with one single cap. These caps will be gone, and instead there's going to be short little caps and threads built into the wishbone. So this wishbone will have the threaded caps as part of the print. They won't be separate parts. So you'll just print this wishbone, and you'll have the threads built in. And the idea is this. So you see the wishbone is just this wishbone with four holes. Well, this wishbone will be the wishbone with the caps built in, and that will allow me to dramatically reduce how much plastic those caps consume. Right now, um, this is 48 grams worth of plastic to make these five caps. I could probably get that down to under 20 grams added to the mass of this. Um, and then what you would do is that these would simply thread. So imagine this cap is a permanent part of the wishbone. You would unthread the, um, the bottle itself. So the bottle itself would unthread from the wishbone. And then when you put it together, you would thread it into the wishbone again. So the bottles would thread directly into the wishbone, which eliminates um, five of those caps. And then this side here, you just make sure the sealed ends are the ends facing out. We're gonna seal the other end too, but make sure the sealed end is the end facing out. And now this end doesn't technically need five threaded caps. In fact, I'd print these without this on here. These threads, I'd just make them go away. They'd be gone and they would just be capped off right there. And this would just put on and you would just use a center cap. And that's enough compression to hold this whole thing together. So one cap. These would be flush, and and I would I would design them to be flush so they don't stick out. And um, although I might just have them have a fakey cap on here, you know that has no threads inside, so that it looks the same as this one. Um, I haven't decided if I want to do that yet because that's less efficient. Um, what I might do though is make this thicker. So this is ten millimeters. I might make it fifteen millimeters. That's going to add another forty grams of plastic. Um, so I gotta, I gotta watch mass, but here's my concern. This design using a single cap 
it saves a tremendous amount of plastic. Because now instead of having to print 10 of these, you only have to print one. So that's um, you know, nine grams instead of 100 grams. And I think I can get this down to seven grams. Um, so um, here's the problem though. This cannot be done with PLA because PLA creeps. So if you were to take a plastic part, okay? This, uh, that one doesn't really bend. But if you were to take a plastic part, here. If I took this plastic part and I applied a bend to it, and I sat here and I held that bend for hours, okay? You know, right now, if I let it go, it goes back to the way it was. And also, I think this is PETG, so this might not have this problem. But PLA has creep. Um, well, I still need the caps on the wishbone so that... Oh. Oh! They don't have to thread if they're compressed. Only the center one has to thread. Good point. The, the end bottles don't need threads at all. Oh, that's good. Only the center would need threads. Boy, that knocks another 50 grams of plastic right off the bat. And I can use that 50 grams of plastic to make these thicker. Oh, Robert, that's fantastic. I, why, didn't, why didn't I think of that? And you know, you know what else that does? My, one of my concerns was that by not having threaded caps, I lose the integrated structure. Integrated structures are very, very strong. The more you can integrate a structure, the stronger it is. So this with 10 caps is absolutely the strongest way to do this. It's so strong, in fact, I'm going to release this even if we come up with a more efficient design. So I'm going to release both. You're going to have strong and you're going to have efficient. Um, so if you want to use more plastic and you just want something really strong, it'll be a pain in the butt. You have to unscrew all kinds of caps to make everything work, but it'll be strong as fuck. And if you ever break a bottle, because we did it strong, the bottles aren't the strength. The threads are the strength. You're only spending 42 grams of plastic to print a new bottle. Um, but for the hyper-efficient version, you're right. Only the, only the center post requires threads. Huh. This doesn't need threads at all. Why the hell didn't I think of that? <laughs> that that's fantastic. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I will, I will be modeling that tonight. Um, now, here's the problem, though. and I don't know. Maybe this is not a problem. This, you cannot make this out of PLA. The threaded version you can make out of PLA. But the efficient version that just has caps, you cannot make out of PLA. And here's why. PLA has what's called creep. When I bend this and I let it go, it returns to its original shape. PLA does not. Now, if I take a PLA part and just do this, it's going to go back to where it was. But if I take a PLA part, if you've ever tried to make a shelf out of PLA, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Your shelf starts to sag and sag and sag. And that's because when you do a simple bracket like this, an L bracket out of PLA, what happens is the plastic starts to warp. And it keeps the warp. The warp doesn't go away. Okay? Once it starts to warp, it keeps warping. Um, so does PETG do that? Does PETG have creep? Or will it keep its shape? Because that's great if it does. Because here's the problem. This works by compression. When you now when now why doesn't it affect this one? Because they're all being compressed. When they're all being compressed, it can't go anywhere. You're creating a unified structure. It's all bolting all together. And this essentially, when you put all five caps on this, this essentially becomes one piece. When you have this all threaded together like this, this is a unified structure. This is all integrated. All these parts are interconnected. They're going nowhere, okay? This is strong. Problem is, it's heavy. 
it's about a pound by itself. Um, so actually, I could probably get away with just um, you build the whole thing empty, but then you can't have them full with sand. That's a pain in the ass. But um, I'll figure something out. But anyway, this is about a, almost a pound by itself, and um, I don't have to worry about creep because it's pinned on all corners. So this can never change shape because it's one unified structure. However, once I use if we switch to a design that only uses the center cap for compression, technically what's happening now is this thing is technically being bent like this. See that? Technically I'm making this into a bowl because these are being pushed up by their connections here while the cap is pushing down in the middle. And that's, that's adding what we call compression and that's good. Yeah, there, there needs to be pressure so that this thing doesn't wiggle wobble all over the place. Um, now, PEG is flexible, which is good, because that allows me to use compression. And that means when it hits the ground, it's it, it should have a, a better likelihood of giving instead of breaking. So the question is, if I get rid of all the caps, I'm going to save a ton of mass, first of all. never going to be as tight and as rigid as the um the fully capped version there's just no way you can do that but basically it'd be this and these i'd get rid of these would go away there'd be no threads at all these end bells wouldn't even have threads they would just sit inside of these cups um and then they would they would stop right here i'd cut them off right there on both ends and um the only one that would have ends would be the center one um, and that would have the cap to thread it together. Now there, hmm. I could cludge a fix. You just tie a string from here to here. That'll keep it together. But that's kludgy. That's very, very kludgy. I don't like that at all. Oh, nice. A portable backpackable drink mixer. That's pretty slick. This chair is too damn low. I got these nice folding chairs. They're um, you know, they're they're designed to hold big fat people like me. Um, and they're fine, except um, the chair is too low to the ground. I'm a big person, and that's even considering that um, you know, I got I have short legs. I have women's legs. <laughs> I got a 27 inch inseam, so I got short little legs and big torso. Um, and so even with my short legs, this chair is still too low to the ground. And so the angle of my joints is too extreme. And it, it, it puts them under strain. So when I get up, all oh, the pain. Oh. Um, I basically have to splay my legs out and turn them sideways. But then your, your knees start to hurt when you do that. Um, and I can't make the chair taller. Because anything I 3D print to extend the height of the chair won't hold my weight. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to find um, you know, a nice heavy-duty 500-pound capacity folding chair that's also taller. But now the idea is to have these be no threads at all. And they just simply sit in here. See, they'll, they'll rotate and just sit in here. Just like that. Um... Hmm. It might even be worth it. I'll have to think about it. See how much wiggle room I have. But it okay. One of the reasons that I like this shape here is that it's a it's a um. What do you call that um? It's an ellipse instead of a cylinder. The only reason this one's a cylinder is to make it thinner so that your hand 
fits on it better. The ellipse allows me to add mass because now it has more volume, but the ellipse is also stronger. So when I squeeze this one, I can actually squeeze the center handle and it deforms when I squeeze it. I can't do that to this. It's, it's far less deformation. And that's because an ellipse means your side walls are an arc and arcs are stronger than flat walls. Always. So um, I can't make these much bigger because then you're going to be back to not fitting. And I can't make this bigger because it won't fit on an Ender 3 or a Prusa. So I need to keep this, I need to keep the parts below 200 millimeters. Um, no, this is a folding chair. You know, a folding chair. So it's not a, it's not a computer chair that I can just add a piston to it. Um, most Amazon folding chairs can't hold me. <laughs> Even the ones that say they're for big and tall, they're not. They're lying. <laughs> I do have some nice chairs. I have a couple of steel case chairs at my other tables. But that one, my nice steel case chair is too big to bring in here. Not enough room. Steel case chairs are nice. They, they'll last forever. Um, but this allows me to not only not only get rid of eight caps, but it allows me to also um, reduce the amount of plastic these consume. And also, now taking this apart is stupidly easy. You just take the cap off of one end, one single cap, and now this pops off, and then you just, you just swap out whatever number of cylinders you need. So, for example, if you want to do one pound, what you would do is take four out, and you could put this on here like this if you wanted to, but in reality, you just hold one of these. You just take one of these, and that's your weight for one pound. When you're ready to go two pounds, um, what we could probably do is just fill the center with sand. <coughs> that would probably be enough. So I have one empty center and one filled center. And fill that center with sand, and the weight of that cylinder with the sand plus the weight of these end caps would be about two pounds. I'll have to weigh it, but that would be about two pounds. That's okay. Probably speak better English than half of us. <laughs> Hi, baby. How you doing? Yeah. You want to sniff? Yeah, you want to sniff? What are you going for? You knock over. No idea what you knocked over. Um, so... A filled cylinder plus the two end caps, that would be about two pounds. Brazil, nice. And now when you want to go to um, three pounds, you swap the center cylinder back to an empty cylinder. And now you just take two cylinders and drop them in here, caddy corner, like this. And you just make sure the... Um, just make sure the sealed end is up. And now you drop this back in place. And now you have a three pound. Now you have a three pound weight and it's balanced. It's, it's the same on both sides. And when you want to go to four pounds, you take the end off, you go back to an empty cylinder in the center here and you put your four filled cylinders in. Put your end cap on. And now you're at four pounds. Roughly. Now you're at four pounds. And then your last um, upgrade is to replace the empty cylinder in the middle with a filled cylinder. And now you're at roughly five pounds. So yeah, that could work. So as long as you can make that tight enough in the center, it will actually come in. It still moves, though. I don't like that. And I can't tighten it enough to stop it from moving. Hmm, I don't like that. It's, it's not a deal breaker, but it is an issue. Now, there is a way I could stop that. So... 
easiest way to stop that is if these aren't round. If the ends of these have a shape. Or if they just have teeth. If they have veins that engage veins on this part. Um, I gotta think about that. I don't, I don't like the way that, that moves. It only moves a little bit. Still, that's annoying. But that would reduce the plastic count so much. And it would make it so much easier for people to interact with this. It wouldn't be such a pain in the ass. Because with, the idea is to get rid of all the threads. If I only had this part here be threaded, um, the, the mass of the entire project dramatically drops. The print time dramatically drops. I mean, probably half of the print time of each of these cylinders is printing the two threaded ends. If I got rid of the two threaded ends, I'd probably knock an hour off the print time of each of these, and I would knock mass off of it. Um, I, would, I would knock 50 grams of mass off just by not having 100 grams of mass off just by not having to have these anymore. Um, everything, this would be more streamlined. It would look nicer. Everything gets better if I get rid of the caps and just use compression. Now, the, the tricky part is there, there is a way I can stop this from wiggling. And the way to do that is to key it. And so what do I mean by that? Well, that's, that's sealed. And the other end's sealed, too. Both ends would be sealed. There'd be nothing to leak. The, um... Um, the sealed end would be the end with the cap on it. And then the end that is open, there would still be a little tiny cylindrical neck. So the, the way I personally would do it is I would stuff a little bit of toilet paper in the end and then hot glue. At that point, I could also 3D print a cap. You just glue the cap on. You could do that too. You know, I have a cap that fits inside and then just glue it in, a little, little super glue. And, um... That, that's worth it at that point for that streamline of shape. The, um, the advantage is now to reconfigure this, they only have to take off one cap. You don't even need to take the other cap off. You just need to take one cap off. Once you take a single cap off, this just comes out. These, these will be coming out a lot easier because they won't have the threads getting in the way anymore. Uh, with no threads, this will just come right off. Super easy. Now, the way I can do this... I gotta figure out how to do it because I can't interfere. It, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be that hard, actually. Yeah, it shouldn't be that hard. Although, how do I do the other end? I have to figure out how to do it. But what I need is a key. So this will have a slot. There'll be a little slot right here, and then this piece here. The center one, the one on there, I don't want to unscrew it. The center one will have a fin. So there'll be a little little fin of plastic sticking out right there. And that fin of plastic would engage the slot on here. So these would key. Um, once they're keyed, if they're keyed, they can't rotate. So that eliminates the rotation problem. The problem is the key has to go on this part, not this part, because I need the threads. can't key threads because then you can't put the cap on. So the fin would have to be just on this part. And I can even do multiple keys. So I can do three keys so that the, the load is spread without, because one key might shear off if you were to turn it too tight. So I could just put three keys on there and then have three keys on here so that once these pieces engaged, they can't rotate. So um, imagine if you had a little a little key sticking out here like that. Well, now you see, you can't rotate now. Now it's locked in place. So three fins, three slots, key, and now it can't rotate. That would work. What's a curling bar? I thought that's what a dumbbell was for curling.
What do you want? What do you want, baby? Yeah. You're such a good boy. You're such a good boy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, isn't curling just doing this? Isn't that curling? Okay, maybe I don't know what curling is. Yeah, just waltz your ass in front of the camera. Well, now you're getting snatched up. Yeah, too late. You don't have a choice now. Now you're getting cuddles. <laughs> yeah? Get in my face, you get cuddles. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Such a good cat. Bad. <laughs> He's my ender. <coughs> a smaller version of a bench press or in a W kind of shape. Well, that's not gonna work for this. This is this is small and compact. This is not meant to be Big. Exactly, that's way too big. Yeah. But curling is just this with both arms at the same time. Isn't that what you just use two dumbbells for? Dumbbells? I thought that's why people did them in pairs. I'm not an expert on this stuff, so I don't really know. <laughs> um... Now, printing this be just became difficult. Hmm. I gotta think about this. Adding fins to this end? No problem. Adding fins to this end? Big problem. I'll show you. So, here's the part, and that's how it's printed. Okay? Adding fins to here is no problem. I just have the fins start right here and stop right here. I have three or four fins on the end of that. And that is perfectly printable. It's vase mode compatible. Everything's perfect. Everything's hunky-dory. But you can't do that side. <laughs> there, there, there's, I, there's no way to easily do this side because the fin would be an overhang. And you can't vase print an overhang like that. And it's got to be on. It's got to be on both ends. If it's not on both ends, it's not going to work. There are kludgy ways I can get around it. I can print the. Um, I can print little caps that would fit over this. You glue them together, and that would add the. Um, um, the fins to engage the slots. But now that's two more pieces you have to print, even if they're tiny, and that's um. Um, now you have to glue parts together. That's that's very very kludgy. I don't want to do that. The other thing I can do is to um, to somehow transition to a non curved surface. So either a triangle or a square. So I would have to transition somehow from from circle to square because then I can make the hole a square now they'd be keyed uh no it can't be internal because then you have no compression the threads have to be external in order to compress because you're compressing the wishbones together onto the handle and so in order to have that compression those threads have to be external because this, this surface here Needs to be pushing on the wishbone and pushing it together. So if you made if you made this an internal thread, there'd be nothing pushing on this. Um, theoretically, you could have um, internal, basically put a bolt on this and have a big fat head. That could work. But that gets a lot more complicated, and I mean a lot more complicated. Um, that gets really, really, really complicated from a CAD point of view. 
from a point of view of me figuring out how to do it, that gets really complicated. Um, the fins are an easier idea. I just gotta, that gives me the lock that I need. Um, what I might need to do is a lot of fins. If I were to use eight fins, for example, I could make the fins a lot smaller. I'm trying to avoid glue. If at all possible, I want to avoid glue. Um, we're already gluing this sealed end shut, the open end shut. I'm trying to avoid glue if I can. Plus, if they use the wrong glue, it'll just shatter or bust itself apart. Um, so the only, the only problem is getting fins on both ends. Now, if I can change the shape, that would be a lot better. Because changing the shape um, retains vase mode compatibility, retains invert compatibility. So it, this side will print just as easy as this side. So the easiest thing to do would be to transition to a square. If I could transition this to a square, but then I'd have to transition back to a circle again for the threads. Um, if I transition to a square surface, um, then I could just have the hole on the ends be square holes. And now it's keyed. It, it won't be able to twist. And it'll be using 100% of the surface area, which means it'll be the strongest it's capable of being. That's the easiest, is to transition. You start here. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to make this thicker. I'm probably going to go 15 millimeters because that'll give me um, a better interface, which will stop some of this. And that'll also um, make up for having weaker ends you know, that, that want to do this. See how that wants to pull out? See how I can pull that out? That's why I'm worried about creep. I'm worried that this will eventually warp and stay warped. Um, Now there is, there is something else I could do. It'd be tricky. It wouldn't be as strong though. If I made this much thicker, See, now we're greatly increasing the mass. I'm, I'm erasing all of my mass savings by doing this. If I made this 20 millimeters and made it invertible so that only half of the 20 millimeters would engage the bottle so that you could... The idea would be to make it so that you could install this in either direction. So you could take this and flip it around and install it this way. Flip it around and install it this way. If I did that, then if the plastic warped, you just flip it over. That would solve the compression issues. You know, where if this became loosey because these parts warped outwards, you just flip them over. Um, now... I could come down to a cylinder like this. And if the cylinder was the interface, so basically leave these on here, but have this actually sit over top of this instead of over top of this. Um, by, by doing that, I can make this invertible. So this can go on either way. But now it's not as... Um, right now... This is, a, this is a cone, and the seat of the wishbone is shaped with the same cone so that these two faces interface perfectly. Um, that's the fact that I'm interfacing this way, this way, and this way. So, um, this is a, a third, okay, so here, how do I describe this? Um, easiest way to describe this, all right cylinder a cylinder interfacing with a cylinder is a two-dimensional interface i'm interfacing this way and i'm interfacing this way okay so it's a two-dimensional interface a cone interfacing with a cone 
is a three-dimensional interface. So the when you have a, a conical surface inside of a conical surface, that's a three-dimensional interface. You're interfacing on all three dimensions. And that is just fundamentally stronger than a 2D interface. That's, the, that, that's part of the reason why this ellipse, even though it's just a slight ellipse, this ellipse is strong. When I, if I squeeze this evenly, there's no deform. I'm squeezing the living hell out of this, and there's no deformation in that tube. Now, of course, if I apply a pressure point with a single finger, I can push in. But if I squeeze, it's like an egg. It's a three-dimensional interface. And it's very, very strong. Versus a cylinder, which is a two-dimensional interface, and I can easily squeeze that all day long. Um, it's not breaking, because it's a one-millimeter nozzle print, but I'm deforming that cylinder. I'm squeezing that cylinder. Well, with this, I got no deformation whatsoever. Okay? So, if I go with a cylinder interface between the weights and the wishbones, I can make the interface invertible without... Um, um, without making it bigger. I can make it so that this wishbone can be flipped over. So if the wishbone starts to warp, all you have to do is unscrew this, flip the wishbone over, and screw it back down again, and then do the same thing with the other side, because the other side is going to warp the same way. And now it'll start warping the other way, and you'll probably get a year out of it before you have to flip them again. Um, that would solve any potential creep issues. Hi. Hi. Yeah, you want to get over here and mess with stuff, don't you? So I'm just going to pet you until you get annoyed with me. And when you get annoyed by me petting you, you'll go away. <laughs> you had enough? Um, more parts. I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah, that, that's more parts that I'm trying to avoid. Um, plus the... The interlock um, needs to be with um, the cylinder, not the cap. Because I thought of that too. I could put teeth here and teeth on the cap and they would interlock, but that wouldn't fix anything because what's twisting is the cylinders. Okay? The actual, um, I mean, I guess it would help a little bit, maybe. But you also now would not be able to compress it as tight because the teeth would stop you from compressing all the way. Um, no, what I need is an interface. I need a, I need a key. It's, it's, it's simple as that. I need a key. There needs to be some sort of a fin or shape of this cylinder that will interface with this cylinder. Now, I don't have to worry about keying the center cylinder because these have a three-dimensional interface, and I'll get my strength from that. So if this only this one doesn't have a 3D interface, that's not a big deal. Um, that would solve this problem. That would stop that. Since the cylinder, the cylinder would not be allowed to rotate relative to the wishbone. Um, well, that's what you have now. What I need is um, I, I need ambidextrous female connections. <laughs> See, the, this is the male. This is the female. I need the female to be ambidextrous. I need it to be reversible. Yeah, you keep trying to climb in front of me. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, I'll just pet you until you get annoyed. <laughs> he wants to crawl in front of me. <laughs> he wants attention. Um, uh, what I want is for... I need this to be keyed in order to have it not do this. Have it not do that. Okay? But I also need this male-female interface to be reversible so that um, if this part warps over time, you can just flip it. I don't know what that means. On the middle or belly of the bottle. Belly of the bottle would be here. That's the way I interpret that. Uh, the tabbing doesn't do anything on the end, really. That's adding complexity where it's not needed. Um, now, the, that would help with um, making it integrate a little bit, but not by much. Um, but that would make... 
it's possible I could tab everything. Once I have this keyed, I can key everything. And I, I guess that's not that big a deal. But it doesn't add much. Because it doesn't rotate here. It rotates here. This is the point of rotation. So I have to stop the... If I stop the rotation here, then there is no rotation here. And there's nothing to stop. So I'd be adding complexity without reason. Now, one advantage of having the tabbing is that um, it would make that interface stronger. Okay, that that might be worth it. Okay, 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 I got an idea. So, if we have a cylinder that is a short cone and a cylinder, and that cylinder has um, um, veins, so it would look, ooh, this, this will work, because these don't need threads. These don't need threads, so the veins can go all the way to the print bed. That will work. That will fucking work. Only this has to have threads on both ends. Only the center cylinder needs threads on both ends. Technically, I only need threads on one end. But um, I, I would rather have the wishbones be the same. So that they're interchangeable. And if I put threads on a wishbone so that the cylinder threaded into the wishbone, it would not be invertible. You wouldn't be able to invert the wishbone. So can't do that. We don't want to do that. But, oh, this... I've the I can add veins to the pink bottles, which will will not only help with integrating the structure a little bit, but it'll add some three-dimensional strength to their connection. They won't just be a cylinder in a cylinder. It'll be a cylinder with fins. And that's not as strong as a three-dimensional interface, but it's much stronger than a simple 2D cylinder interface. I can do that. Oh, I can do that. I can absolutely do that. But what did I just do? Back in. Yeah, that that I can do. Hang on, I'm gonna bring that up. Oh, that that's good. That's good. I can I I can absolutely do that. I can also make the cylinder bigger, so it'll be stronger. Because I don't need such a skinny neck now. I think it's this one. Okay, let me bring up the chat on my phone so that I can give you guys a full screen view of what I'm doing here. I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. Where is my stream notification? I just saw it. There it is. A different name. Okay. There we go. We gotta change that to live chat. All messages. I hate that so much. Okay. See you later, Fernando. Thank you for joining in. Oh, man. I can really, really reduce the plastic count on this. Okay. This is actually really easy. Um, now let me switch you guys to computer screen mode. There you go. So now you guys can see what I see. Um, so here's my, like, here's my cylinder. Which we're going to have to work on. But let's work on this one first. Okay, so I guess the first thing to do is to break it apart. Let's take one of these, delete that. So the first thing's first, I can make this bigger now. <laughs> this does not have to be um, as skinny. And just making it thicker is going to dramatically increase its strength. So let's see, we have 40, so let's go 35. Let's see what that looks like. 35 and 35. 
and then center, center line. Then we raise until we have interface. So now we have just this little beveled edge. Okay. Tiny bevel. Join this together. Now we're going to export this and then import it to make it a simplified object. Oh no, something went wrong. Actually, um, it'd probably be better if I just got rid of um, the threading to begin with. Oh, I need power. I forgot to switch back to power for this. <laughs> for the computer. Oh, yeah, it was almost dead. Woo! We were down to 19%. Okay, so split this apart. What I need to do is to chop off. Can this be split anymore? No, it's a solid piece. So need to do this. I need to get rid of the complexity of this thread. Join that. Now join these. And join that. That gets rid of all that complexity. Now we export this. And then we import it again. The purpose of exporting and importing is to get rid of the history. Sometimes you want the history of the model so that you can go backwards a step, but that also greatly increases the complexity of the model. Um, that is a little more difficult than you think because um, the, the square shape is nowhere near as strong as the round shape, not even close. And you have to transition from one to the other, which can get annoying. It's possible, and we might do that. The optimal number of sides is eight. That's the gentlest transition from a circle to an, a polygon. But eight might not be sufficient keying to stop um, twisting. Um, but for the end caps, we don't need that necessarily, so we don't have to get that complex. Okay, so let's see. How do I, 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 I think I want to make that actually smaller. Because I want, I want fin room. There's no room for fins if I do this. Um, yeah, let's go 30. Let's go 30. Round is much stronger. If we can stick with round, it's a much stronger interface. Okay, there we go. Um, what I don't like is I'd like the bevel to be less. This bevel doesn't need to be this thick. But a greater angle on the bevel is also not good. How tall is this? 33 millimeters. Nah, got to make that shorter. And we are 15 millimeters tall. So we're already at 15 millimeters. Now what I could do is increase the wishbone to 20. It'll take a little bit more plastic. It'll take 33% more plastic. That will be 120 grams, which is not horrible. That'll be one, uh, we, um, yeah, about 120 each versus 90. But I could reduce the amount of infill too. See what else can I do? Um, I guess shorten this. Twenty. All right, will that print? I am rude. Yes, especially with the veins. I think that'll print. Yeah, I think that'll print just fine. Now, the veins are going to have to be one millimeter thick. So, one point one for tolerance. I hate when it does that. Why? Why? Why does it keep leaving? It keeps leaving the goddamn box. See? I click the box and it leaves the box. 
1.2, 0 0.2 millimeters of tolerance. This is 40 millimeters. No, that's that. The whole thing. Oh, is this centered? Yes. Going. The whole thing is 40. That means this needs to be 40. See, it did it again. It left the fucking box. Stay in the box. I think it's it's touching the um the rotation icon, which is resetting what it's going to. That's what I think is happening. So yeah, I click on the box and I click on this, and when I touch that, see how the focus leaves the box with the number? I think that's what was happening, because I was around like this, and so as soon as I moved the mouse away, I was hitting this. So I kept seeing that flash, and that's that was taking away the focus from the box, and that, that, that's all that was doing. Okay, so now we take this, we center it, we take this, control D, now, I think four would be enough. Now I could just do a 90 degree, I have four veins, especially since we're going to do it for all of them, I think that would be enough. Yeah, I think that would be enough. Although I'm going to, I'm going to bevel. I need to bevel these shapes just a tiny bit. Well, this shape cannot be beveled. I need two. I need a cut tool and I need a a finish tool. So take this, Control D. Okay, so this all needs to be straight. Um, this needs to be a hair bigger. Let's go to. 40.2 by 40.2, okay, and let's make this 1.4, 1.4, okay, recenter everything, center, center, uh, deselected, center, and then join. So this is going to be my cutting tool for the wishbone. I made the parts oversized so that it'll there'll be a little bit of tolerance. Because um, otherwise it's not going to go together. Now this will also need some tolerance built into it. So the way we do that is we made this 30, right? 30, okay. Um, so we'll take a cylinder. we we'll make it... 35, maximum sides, then we take a cone, thirty-five. Okay. We take that cone. Come on. Invert it. Put it into a hole. We align it with this part. Uh huh. Uh huh. There we go. Join it. Now I have a cutting tool to put a cha oh, son of a bitch. I have a cutting tool to put a chamfer on this. So align center on that part. Now I can use this to cut a small chamfer into that part do that that should not take long that's just that's just two cylinders in a cone that should not take that long why was that taking that long this and this should be a simple quick join there we go so now we have a champ. Oh, I did. I messed that up. Okay. Split this apart. Forgot to increase the number of sides for the cone. Uh, top raise height sides. There we go. Now I can join this with this. Turn it into a hole cutter. Join this with this. Turn it into a cut. 
Okay, that gives me a small chamfer on the end of the bottle to make sure the um, it'll actually slide into the hole. I probably don't need that much of a chamfer, but it's fine because it won't affect the cut tool. Um, the reason I... Oh, this can't be 1.2. This has to be 2 millimeters. This has to be 2.2. Oh, I screwed that up. Um, 2.25. Would you please stop fucking with me? Oh, I forgot about that. Now this could be 2.1. 2.1. Because the nozzle is one millimeter. So it has to be able to... Um, So 2.3, 2.3, recenter. I need enough for both paths of the nozzle. If you're using a one millimeter nozzle, you can't make a part thinner than two millimeters. Okay, that is all centered. That is my cut tool. Um, we have our chamfer there. Let's delete this one and add a chamfer here. So we will do that with this. Now, the, the only reason we're doing this is to account for splooge. Account for the, um, the first layer being a little sloppy. Um, so that we get a good insertion. Yeah, that's fine. Increase the angle a little bit. There we go. All right, so now we take this, we duplicate it, we join it with this. And then we take this and rotate it 180. And then join it again. That gets us our double chamfer. Then we duplicate, rotate 180, or 190. And verify everything. Do not select the other part, you dumbass. Come on. Stop it. Why are you picking over there? I hate when it does that. And we are not centered here, but now we are. Now we join this together. Okay. <coughs> That's the two ends of our cap, our bottle. Um... I mean, we don't have to make this shorter, but I need to make this longer. How much longer, though? Close enough. Now we put our work plane here. We put this to uh, zero. Zero. Now I duplicate this. Rotate it. 180 degrees. Get it up in the air like that. Work plane here. Drop it down to zero. There. That keeps it overall the same size. It'll actually increase the size a tiny bit. So it'll actually be slightly higher area, which we need. There we go. Now we take all of this, join it together, and there's our new bottle. So now the, um, the bottles on the outside will all be keyed. Okay. And there should be enough tolerance to avoid any issues. So let's take this apart. I'll probably need those later, but maybe not. Oh no, I need them. Um. 
So yeah, should be able to take these and bring them to zero. Then take this, bring it to zero. And then take this. Now I should just be able to simply center this on these four. Take this, this, center it on this. Yes, that'll work. Take this and this, center it on this one. Take this and this. Center it on this. Not what I want you to do. You need to learn to listen. Take this and this. Oh, we need another duplicate. Control D. We have a spare. Center it on this. You did it again, you son of a bitch. There. Now I can delete these. Now I can take these and turn them into holes. Into holes. And, oh, no, nope, we don't have a full interface. Uh, oh, yeah, we do. I think we do. Is that actually open there? Like, is it not interfacing there? What I really need to do is to get rid of everything in the wishbone. Yeah. There we go. Eat. Yeah, much better. Let's go virgin. Um... This we're going to leave for now. I think I need it. Why does it do that? Like, what's not interfacing? Oh, there's a there's something wrong inside of there. Hmm. I'll worry about that later. Oh boy. Oh, 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 oh. I just messed it up. I just messed it up big time. Um, how easy to fix that. Hmm. Oh boy. Yeah, I, I just I I broke it. Can't do that. Yeah, I big time screwed that up. Um, I, I changed the length of this cylinder. And because the interface is different, see part of the length of this cylinder sticks out of this. Um, which means I cannot change the length of this section, otherwise the two won't interface the same. Oh, that's a big screw up. Okay, um, let's do this. Okay, there we go. I need to get back to this. This needs to be the same as this. Um... Uh, maybe not. Ooh, that's, that's so iffy. No, this one has to be significantly shorter. Because it's not going to be sticking out as much.
Well, this needs to be the same length as this. Um, nope, that's still not going to work. Um, there's a, a, a change I have to make. How do I do this? Okay, I can join these to get back together again. Um, this needs to be in the same relative position. This. Oh man, I, I, I forgot about that. They all have to interface with the cylinders at the same exact spot, or it won't it won't sit right. <coughs> this part's okay. I can cut this. It's it's figuring out how long this needs to be. So I think I just need to adjust this here. But this is the wrong length. That's not right. Um, yeah, so when I made this cut tool, I did it differently. Okay. Um, Why is that so much bigger? Why is this cylinder so much bigger? Two hundred eighty millimeters. That's why it's too big. Um, when I originally made it, I made it that big. Um, uh, And worse, the whole thing's now bigger. Hmm. How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? I guess design the interface for the center, then worry about putting it together. We're just going to delete this. You know that's wrong. Um, these two are right. That's 210 millimeters. So let's get the interface for this one designed. I might not have to use as many faces since um we are we're slotting the t we're tabbing the ones on the end. Uh, it's this. It's the parts to make a dumbbell. So right now, the way the dumbbell works is you have 10 of these caps that thread onto the end of each of these bottles. And you screw them all together. These, are filled with, these will be filled with sand, and you have a dumbbell. Because you can adjust how many of these bottles you install, you can adjust the weight from 1 pound to 5 pounds, roughly. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way of simplifying it. Making it more efficient, making it use less plastic, make it easier for the end user to modify it. 
right now, if you want to change the number of weights on this thing, you have to unscrew all 10 of the threaded caps, take it apart, put it back together in whatever configuration you want. I'm trying to figure out a way to do this. So have these not be threaded at all, so this will all be gone, and only have the center two caps threaded. Because that means you only have to take off the center cap, and then you can pull the whole thing apart and do whatever you want to do. Um, but there's two problems with that. One, I'm worried about plastic creep. I'm worried about this piece here warping over time from being compressed, since that compression is what's holding it together. Um, two, I need this piece to be invertible. This way, if it does creep and warp, you can just flip it and put it back together again. Um, now, the other issue is um, it twists now. So now when you're holding it like this, you can twist it. Okay? No matter how tight you make that center cap, you can twist it because this is the pivot point and there's nothing holding it from twisting. So we're adding slots and veins to these so that they're a little more resistant to twisting. And that might actually be enough. Maybe I'm overcomplicating this and I don't need any kind of interface for the center. Because if all four of these are vein interlocked, that might be enough to keep this whole thing from twisting, even if the center isn't vein interlocked. That might actually be that simple. It, it really might really be that simple. We can test it. Compress the shit out of the, um, the ends, and then take the center off and see if it twists. Oh man, that's going to make it so much easier if that works. We can actually test this. See how long it takes to put this together? You got so many caps you got to put on. So it's totally modular, but it's also a pain in the butt. And if I can make it simpler, I'd rather make it simpler. Plus, simpler almost always equals less plastic. Now, here's the trick. I should be able to take these caps off altogether. Now, does it still twist? No. I, I can make it twist because these are not slotted, but it's resistant. So we don't have to slot the center. I don't have to modify the center. If I slot the ends, the center does not have to be modified. Okay, that makes my life so much easier. <laughs> oh my God, that makes my life so much easier. <laughs> now I do have one problem, and that is that I've modified the physical dimensions of this piece. Um, I need to make sure that um, they interface at the same time. Well, sort of works. It, um, we're still compressing in the center, so we should be okay. My objective is to, this isn't for people who are weightlifting because they're probably going to be above um, five pounds. This is only for going for one to five pounds, maybe six pounds. Um, the purpose of this is, first of all, I want it to be as close to 100% 3D printable as possible. I want it to use as little plastic as physically possible. And matter of fact, most of these parts print in vase mode if you use a one millimeter nozzle. You do have to use PETG, PLA is just not really good for this. Although, now that we can invert the end caps, we can use, um, we can use, um, PLA. Oh, that reminds me, I gotta flip my cut tool. I have to cut it both sides so that it's invertible. Um, but the idea is for physical therapy patients who don't need a lot of weight. So, for example, they'll start off with just one of these. That's one pound. So just do that. And then when you want two pounds, you put two cylinders in here. When you want three pounds, you put 
three cylinders in here. When you want four pounds, you put four cylinders in here. Like this one would be empty, for example. And when you want five pounds, you use five filled cylinders. But basically, it'll come with all these parts plus one extra of this cylinder here. One will be filled, one will be empty. The reason for that is so that you can adjust. The, the, the idea is to not only just adjust the weight, but to keep it balanced. Okay? So to do one pound, um, you could basically just use the empty cylinder and the two end caps. That'll be about one pound. Um, then when you want to do two pounds, um, you add two weighted cylinders. Um, so you put one here, then you put one over here diagonally. And that keeps it balanced so that this doesn't become lopsided. See, if you put two on one end, now it's heavy this side and light on this side, and so it's, it's not balanced. This allows you to keep it balanced. When you're ready to go to three pounds, you just swap out the center cylinder for a filled one. Now you have one, two, three cylinders that are filled. Now you have a three pound um, dumbbell. When you want to go to four pounds, you swap back to the empty cylinder in the center, and you put four filled cylinders on the outside. Now you have about four pounds. And then when you're ready to go to um, five pounds, you just use all filled cylinders. And now you have a five, well, probably about a five and a half pound dumbbell. Um, but the idea is you can make small, roughly one pound increments to increase the weight. This is for um, invalid patients, um, physical recovery patients. You know, where they're, they're not doing a lot of weight. They're just trying to tone muscles. They're trying to regain um, dexterity and control and the ability to, you know, pick up a bottle in your house. There are patients, you know, they have difficulty picking up. A bottle like this would be difficult for them to pick up because they're, they don't have the grip, they don't have the strength to hold it. And so this is for those kind of people. And the idea is to make this super, super cheap to print. My objective is to get under five pounds, I'm, I'm under five dollars total, including the sand, um, to get under five dollars each to make one of these. And then um, I would love to get a pair of them under five pounds, but... The weight of the wishbones just doesn't let that be possible. Um, so it's about a dollar's worth of sand, probably about four dollars worth of plastic. That's the objective here. To get to around 340 grams. And that'll also let you print three full sets on one kilogram of plastic. That's the objective. Um, so one of the heaviest things in this is the wishbones, which are 90 grams each, and the caps, which total... Um, almost 100 grams. So this is gonna let me get rid of um, 82 grams worth of cap plastic, although I'm going to be increasing the thickness of this by 30%, but I'm gonna try decreasing the amount of infill to compensate for that a little bit. Plus a little extra flexibility would be a good thing at this point. Um, uh, we'll be reducing the weight of these by a tiny bit by getting rid of the um, by being able to get rid of the caps and some of the plastic as well. It'll streamline the entire side. It'll also increase bed adhesion. It'll stick to the bed a little better. So yeah, this should be pretty nice. So that's the whole, re the reason for the shapes, the water bottle shape is, well, originally I was gonna use water. And yes, that's watertight, that, that's holding the water. And I was gonna use bottle caps. Um, the problem is, well, there, you'll have to watch the previous video, but, um. Bottle caps have a J-hook interface, which means you can't put a bottle cap on a closed end unless you get one of the bottle caps that has the blue seal inside, and that's random. Um, and not having a closed end would make bed adhesion more difficult. But also, um, bottle caps are slightly different in size, and I'm using compression to hold this together. Well, I've just eliminated all the bottle caps. Now I just need two caps, and I can print those caps. All I need is these two, and that's it. And um, everything will be held together with compression. And also, I found out that water would dramatically increase the size of this. You can see there's a pretty big difference in size. Well, that's how big you need to be to hold a pound of water. And I guess you have the other one here. Uh -huh. That bottle will hold a pound of water. That bottle will hold a pound of sand. So as you can see, the sand bottle is quite a bit smaller than the water bottle. The sand is 66% more dense, on average, than water is. Um, so while water would be nice, because that's essentially free, you, well, first of all, you could ship this for a lot less, because um, if you printed it and shipped it, um, 
because you wouldn't have to ship it with water in it. You can tell the customer, open the cap, fill it with water. No problem, right? Um, the pro there's several problems with that. One, it makes it a lot bigger. You need a lot more plastic to hold it. Number two, um, um, if this hits the ground, I'm not so sure that's going to hold together. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, water, you know, especially water, because water can create that hydroshock effect on the inside, and this thing can just blow apart. Water is pretty, pretty nasty under the right conditions. Um, but also, any leak at all, any compromise in this structure at all, and it's going to leak. Sand, you'd have to have an actual hole for the sand to leak out. And it's, it's also slightly less messy. Well, yes and no. Technically, water's less messy because it's just water. You mop it up or you wait for it to dry. Well, sand, you're never going to get all the sand out of your carpet. You won't know there's any there, but you're never going to get it all out. <laughs> um, but sand is less likely to become a mess to begin with. And it also allows me to make the whole thing a lot smaller. The whole, oh, I want every single piece of this to be printed on an Ender 3 or a Prusa. So basically 200 by 200 by 200. Um, I, I, I made the length 210. So the, the height of the cylinder is 210 millimeters. But the idea was to make sure that anybody with any printer could print this. If you have a one millimeter nozzle, great. You can make it really strong. Um, if you don't have a one millimeter nozzle, all of this is still perfectly printable because we no longer need watertight. Um, with watertight, you really want the one millimeter nozzle. But now that we don't need watertight, you can just print with three walls. Well, that's what this does. The whole, well, first of all, it improves your grip because you have to hold this. And what you do is you just do exercises, whatever the physical therapist tells you to do, you know, whether it's curls or doing these kind of exercises or, you know, these kind of exercises to work all the different muscle groups. So each time you rotate your arm, you're actually working a different set of muscles to hold up to um, these movements. And um, so you, do, you, know, you got your standard curls too. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to have these sites on my store. I'm also going to have them for free on Thingiverse and printables. So people who can afford to donate to me to buy them can buy them. People who can't, just download them. You know, especially for people who are going to be making sets for physical therapists. I don't want to charge them because they're going to be donating their plastic to make sets to give away to a physical therapist. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have these available. And um, But yeah, that, that's all you do. You, know, you start off with the one pound. Okay, so you just you have one of these filled with sand. That's about a pound. A little less than a pound is about a pound. And you just you curl that. That's it. And then um, when you um, when they're ready to go up in mass, you just add the appropriate number of sand-filled cylinders to your multi-configuration dumbbell unit here uh, until you you know when they've mastered one pound where that's no problem, go to two pounds. When that's no problem, then you go to three pounds. So that's the whole point. But yes, this would be perfect. This, this, is, this is exactly who it's designed for, for people like your grandparents who just have a physical capacity issue where they just need to have some physical therapy to help out with that. Um, that's the whole point of this. That's the reason I made it. Um, you know, we were talking about it. You know, I was, I, was, I, I, I was using jugs. I was just using jugs like this to curl because you know, I have no grip issues. I can hold something like this. And then I realized, you know, I was like, I was like, you know, I can hold this. But the, like, the, you know, that 85-year-old lady that I saw at the physical therapy center, she ain't going to be able to do that. There's no way in hell she's going to be able to do this. You know, even if she can actually curl that much weight, she's not going to be able to grip that bottle. And I was like, can I print a solution? <laughs> and I went online, I looked up dumbbells, and they're thirty to forty dollars each for an adjustable dumbbell set. Um, it's going to cost you at least forty to buy individual dumbbells. To get an adjustable set, you're looking at thirty or forty bucks. You know, so a set is about thirty or forty dollars for one. And um, there are ways to do it cheaper. Um, if you go to Five and Below and buy individual dumbbells, I think it was like nineteen bucks. That would get you one full set. You know, that would get you a one. Three, five, or something like that. One, two, three, five, or something like that. Um, it'd be close, but that's still twenty bucks plus the gas to go to a five below. My nearest five and below is thirty miles away, so that's sixty mile drive. Get you know to save ten bucks on a dumbbell. Fuck that. I'm just gonna pay the thirty bucks on Amazon and order it. <laughs> um, 
But if I could just print it for four dollars, and if you don't care about the precision of the weight, um, if you live in a sandy climate, you can just go outside and fill it with sand. You don't even have to buy sand, but you can get a bag of sand at Walmart for five dollars and twenty four cents, and there's enough sand in there to do like five or six of these, at least. Um, but yeah, so that that's where we're at. That's what we're going to. We're just trying to now we're this is done. You know, this is usable. Now I'm trying to optimize, make it more efficient. Um, I realized, you know, as you saw me assemble this, it's a pain in the ass. In order to change the configuration of this, even though this is ridiculously strong, I mean, this is so strong, it's crazy. Um, you know, because I tend to overbuild. I tend to make things really, really strong. Um, so I way overbuilt it, way overengineered it. It doesn't need to be this strong, um, although it's nice. So I'm going to release this one, too. I'm going to release these files as well. Um, just because, you know, for people who don't mind putting in the extra effort to screw and unscrew, uh, this will last forever, essentially. If you break this one, uh, a little bulky. No, that's actually pretty compact. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm amazed I got it this compact. So this, this whole thing will fit on an end of three. Each of these parts. Every part is 210 millimeters or less. So the size of these parts was dictated by the volume and, and density of sand. So one pound of sand. Now, of course, different sand, different densities, different weights. Um, but the sand you buy in a store, approximately, um, one pound is 300,000 cubic millimeters. About a third of a liter. Um, and that's, this is approximate. This is exactly um, a third of a liter right here. This is 300,000 cubic millimeters. But um, this was too big. It's, it's too, it was too big for you to grip onto like this. That's why this one's a cylinder instead of a round like this. Um, but even that was still too big, uh, this here. I mean, again, I can grip this, no problem. But I'm, I'm pretty sure some of the people that I saw at the therapy center would have difficulty gripping something this big around. They might not have enough grip strength to hold on to something that big. So the, uh, you got to get closer to the size of a handle, and this is closer to that. This is a, it'll be a lot easier to grip. Um, these are bulbous shaped to increase their volume and increase their strength. Uh, the reason I don't like using cylinders is cylinders are two-dimensional objects, while the bulb shape is a dimensional object. Um, as far as strength is concerned, um, when you when you okay, a cylinder is a three D object. But the interface, the interface between your hand and the cylinder is a two-dimensional interface. It's a plane. Uh -huh. If you take a cylinder, what is your interface? Your interface is the contact patch between your hand and the cylinder. Okay, unfold the cylinder. It's a plane. It's a 2D interface. Okay? But now take a sphere and unfold it. It's still 3D. You'd have to cut it like an orange to make it sit flat. That's why maps are a little weird, okay? So curved surfaces provide a three-dimensional interface between the two objects. So I can take this and squeeze it as hard as I can, and there is no deformation in that shape. Now, if, obviously, if I take my fingers and press on a pressure point, I can probably perform it and break it. But if I wrap and enclose it and then try to squeeze it, I cannot break this. I can compress the cylinder. I can feel this. I'm just giving this gentle squeezes. I can feel that cylinder compressing under my fingers. Still more than strong enough with one millimeter print, but the curve shape is substantially stronger. So we try to stick with curved shapes. Um, that's going to make this a lot stronger if it hits the ground which I still have to do. I still have to do drop testing, see how well this survives if I drop it onto a, a tile floor in the kitchen, for example. On a carpet, no problem. On grass outside, no problem. But your tile floor or wood floor, I gotta see how well it holds up to that. Although some of the changes we're making are gonna dramatically improve how well it holds up to that. Um, because we're eliminating some of the weak points. Um, so this is incredibly strong, but it's also a pain in the ass to adjust got to unscrew all 10 of these. Well, maybe nine. 
Sometimes you'll be able to leave one. But you got to unscrew all ten of these to be able to change anything. Because um, even if you take these five off and remove this half, you still you still can't pull any of these out or add any new ones. You have to unscrew all of this to change all of this, and that's that's annoying. Plus, these caps are heavy. They're a little over nine grams each, and you need ten of them. Um, Twelve if you including some for the spare cylinder. Um, so that's uh, you know a hundred grams of plastic right there. Just that's a third of the weight of the model just from that. Um, then the wishbones are pretty heavy. So they need to be. They're 186 grams for the pair. So that's um, was it 88 grams each roughly? Um, um they're going to actually get a little heavier. I'm going to make them thicker. Um, but we're going to get rid of the caps. We're going to add um maybe 50 grams to the wishbones, but we're going to subtract 100 grams from the caps, and we're going to probably subtract another 10 grams from other changes we're making. Um, so I'm hoping to get it under 400 grams. Hoping that um, it probably won't. It's probably going to be a two per roll print, but I'm hoping to get it to three per roll so I can get it below four dollars per print. But I think we're going to be at about five bucks a print um, for just the plastic. But by changing to where I use compression and keying to hold everything together, now we only need two caps. So we do, we need two for the compression. We need the compression. So we need these two caps, but we don't need these eight. So these eight can go away. And then all you have to do is undo one single screw and you can adjust this. Two screws if you have to change the center, right? If you don't have to change the center, you only have to do, um, um, only have to do one cap. Take the one cap off, the end pops off. You pop out your cylinders, you pop in your cylinders, you recap it, you're good to go. Um, so I think that's going to work really, really well. And that's where we're at right now inside Tinkercad. I've just modified the caps and my cut tools to be able to make the appropriate pieces of plastic. But now I, I realized I screwed up. I have to make sure that um, the wishbone has to interface both cylinders in exactly the same spot. Otherwise, it's going to be cockeyed right because these cylinders are all identical just the center changed but the ends and the length overall and the interface are the same this all goes together i need to make sure that they all interface exactly the same way because if they don't they ain't gonna work right <laughs> uh, okay so let's go back to that um so first of all i need to modify this Let's just hide this for a moment. I need to take these. And I need to join them together. I need to duplicate them. I need to invert this. There, see? I have to cut that bevel into both sides. And that is why I had to make it thicker. I had to make sure we still had an actual cylindrical edge here. I would like to make this bevel thinner, but that creates problems. Now, the reason for this is so that it can be inverted. Um, so you can flip it upside down. That's really important. So I should be able to join this. So there's our interface. Okay. So you have the beveled surface. So you have a three-dimensional contact patch. You have a cylinder for um, the, the wiggle and the, the centering. You have the slots, which will help both with wiggle, and the slots will also help with twist. Um, but now, because I made this thicker, I was able to do this on both sides. So you can take this piece here and invert it. And it's exactly the same interface. Why do we want to do that? That's very simple. That solves the other problem that I have. The other problem that I have is that this is um how best to describe this. The by not having these screws on the end here, 
this wishbone is being compressed, but only in the center. So, if I have my four posts on the outside, and I have the one wishbone in the center, the whole piece is getting warped like that. Okay. Now, over time, it might keep some of that warp, meaning it, it, will, it will no longer be straight. It will become permanently warped. If that happens, it's going to loosen, meaning the compression that holds these outside cylinders in place will become looser and they'll start wiggling because you won't be able to tighten this down enough because this piece here is now curved. There are two ways I'm fixing that. One, I'm making the wishbone 30% thicker. So instead of 15 millimeters thick, now it's 20 millimeters thick. Yes, that makes it heavier, but that also makes it much more resilient. By making it thicker, I could make the interface to the outside cylinders bi-directional. Because now there's enough meat to be able to do that. Which means, when this if this cylinder warps and becomes loose, all you have to do is unscrew both end caps and flip them over. And so now, instead of being warped this way, they'll be warped this way. And once again, they'll compress. Um, so that solves the compression problem. Even if that happens every couple of months, you could just take the end caps off and flip over the wishbones and put it back together. Which means you can print this in PLA. I, would, I suggest printing this in PETG only for both temperature stability and for creep. PLA creeps. That's where it starts bending and it keeps the bend. However, because this is invertible and you can flip it over to compensate for that bend, you can print this in PLA. So if you're going to make these to donate, only use PETG. But if you're going to make it for yourself, there's no reason you can't use PLA now. Um, and same with this one. This one can use PLA because it's, it's screwed on all five threads, so it can't creep. This, this can't move anywhere. This is an integrated, fully integrated structure. It's not going nowhere. Um, but the new, more efficient one that I'm making... That one needs to be PETG, but if you're going to make one for yourself and you understand that it might creep over time, then you can use PLA and you just invert the ends and it'll recompress again. Um, I don't know if PLA um, fatigues. In fact, I do know it fatigues, but will it fatigue as a result of creep? You know, you take a paper clip, bend it, bend it, bend it, crack, and it snaps. But if you were to take like a piece of copper, you can go bend, 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 bend all day. All right? That's because that's ductility. Some metals are more ductile than others. Aluminum has that problem. It fatigues. You bend aluminum too much, it cracks. So the question, so eventually that part might creep easier and easier. You might have to flip it every week. I don't know. I have no idea. But by making it 20 millimeters thick and by making it flippable, um, the fatigue rate of the plastic will probably exceed the length of time where you will maintain possession of it without losing it. <laughs> You'll probably have thrown it away or lost it before it fatigues at that point. So we're okay with that. Because if you can make this out of PLA, then even if it takes half a kilo, we're down to around four bucks. You can get PLA as cheap as eight or nine dollars a kilo. Get it cheap enough. Uh, but again, if you're printing one for yourself, that doesn't matter. You know, hell, I mean, buy um, some carbon fiber nylon and print a set. That'll be strong. <laughs> Although, good, good luck printing one. Good luck getting that to stay attached to the bed with um, uh, carbon fiber nylon. It, 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 it barely sticks to the bed. Small parts, I have no problem printing. But even small parts, I could take the part and just go pink, and it pops right off the bed. Because the nylon doesn't like to stick to damn thing or anything. Okay, so the wishbone is basically done. Okay. So now what I need to do... Hey, James White. I need to put these parts in their place. Um, let's try that. 
Let's control D this. Let's center this. That. Um, uh, let's see. We don't know how this is going to have to go together yet. So let, this is wrong, but let me join this together like it is. I just need to get it in place. That did not join what I asked it to. Asshole. What's that? I I gotta I gotta add some text here just to get that message to appear. There it goes. You know you can the, the heart symbol hides part of your text. You know you can take a strap and put it around so you don't need to grab so much. Still use the weights. I don't understand. Well, first of all, my intention is to be 100% 3D printed. So, no buying extra hardware. So, and I, I also want it to be modular. Take it apart and put it together. What we're doing right now is making it better modular. This is very modular, but it's a little bit of a pain in the butt. This has the advantage of being all 3D printed. There's no hardware, except for a little bit of glue to seal the end of the um, cylinder for the sand. A little bit of hot glue to seal the end up. Uh, or super glue. Um, except for that, there's no glue, there's no fasteners, there's no nothing. Everything is threaded. Everything threads together. This is incredibly strong. It's very useful. The, the downfall is it uses a bit more plastic than I'd like. About a pound. Um... And also, it um, it's a pain in the butt to change. So if I want to modify this to a different configuration, it's very configurable, but you have to undo all 10 of these threads to change the configuration. That's a pain in the ass. <laughs> That's a real pain in the butt. So what we're trying to do now, this is done. I'm going to post this. If you want to print the, the ridiculously strong... Annoying, but really nice quality one. You can do that. But now I'm trying to make it um, more efficient, meaning use less plastic. My ultimate goal, which I don't think I can get to. Maybe. I, I'll work on it. Um, but I, my objective is to get under 340 grams. Because if I can get under 340 grams, then I can print three full sets with one kilo of plastic. And that would bring the cost down to about $3.60 in plastic. And then you add a dollar's worth of sand, and you have the total cost below 5 bucks. That's my objective. You get the total cost to print one of these below 5 bucks, including the sand for the mass. Um, right now, I'm closer to $6, which is not too bad. But if I can get under 5 I'd like to, because you can buy a roll of PLPTG for $11. Um, on Amazon. You can, relatively regularly, you can find one. Um, now, also being under a pound, you can buy, for example, a half kilo roll of plastic. You can buy a 500 gram roll of like some nice color you want, and that will be enough plastic to print the whole thing. Um, so that's the objective, is to make it modular. Um, this is not... Uh, I mean, people like you can use this, but the design intent is for physical therapy patients. Oh, oh, oh. Who both have dexterity issues, grip issues, and also financial issues. Meaning they can't afford to buy the $30, $40, you know, adjustable dumbbell set off Amazon. Um, I think the lowest I got was $29 buying individual weights. But you only get one set, not two. Um, although, if you gave up some of the numbers, if you, I think it was one pound, two pound, three pound, five pound. There was no four pound. You can get one set for like 19 bucks from five and below. Um, but again, if you got two, you're back up to $40. With this, for less than $10, you can print two. And so you can have two to work simultaneously if you want to. Um, or just go real cheap, print one. And do your left hand first, and do your right hand, you know. Money's money. Um, so... The design criteria is um, under 500 grams with a stretch goal of under 340 grams. 
um, modular, no purchasing extra hardware, everything 3D printed. The only exception we're allowing is a little bit of um, hot glue to fill in the open end, because one end is open, um, which is easier. Yeah. So, you know, one end is closed, but one end is open by necessity. You have to have an open end because you have to be able to fill it with sand. Um, so the, you'll fill it. What I would tell people to do is stuff a little toilet paper in there, then hot glue or epoxy, whatever glue you want. Um, that's it. That'll hold it. Um, the, um, I realize that there's a usability issue with having so many threaded parts that are a pain in the butt, especially these here because they're knuckle busters. When you turn this, you're going to turn your knuckle right into that other one. And, you know, I've already hurt myself a couple times doing that. No, not paying attention. <laughs> um, so getting rid of those also eliminates that. Um, the idea is to make this cheap enough and easy enough to make. That means a small number of parts as possible. So that people like you guys could print a couple sets as a community service project and donate them to a local um, you know, physical therapy um, center. You know, for financially challenged people who can't afford to buy this kind of stuff. You know, people who are physically fit, you know, we can just do what I've been doing. You grab a water bottle and you, you, you do that. And I can control how much this weighs by how much water is in here. Um, but, you know, that 85-year-old lady who uses a walker <laughs> to get into the therapy center, you know, she can't hold that. Maybe it was empty, but now she's not getting any work. Right, you put any weight in that, and she can't hold it. Just, you know, even a milk jug, um, you can wrap your hand around the milk jug handle, but you start curling that, and it's going to hurt your hand, especially if you're a challenged patient. So this is something that's very easy for a person to grip a hold of, and the, because the modular design is designed to be symmetrical. So, for example, if I wanted two pounds, I would just do this weight and this weight. Yeah, they're opposite each other. And this way, the configuration still maintains symmetry in both size and mass. So it's not pulling one way or the other. So it's, it stays symmetrical, both in weight and in dimension. And um, you go from one pound up to, well, if, I, if this is around a pound, you can actually go from one pound to six pounds. So you could have an empty handle and a fully assembled unit. That's about a pound. Then fill this one with sand, you'll know, replace it. You know, the, the piece will come with six cylinders. You're going to come with the four pink ones, you know, whatever color you print, and it'll come with two of these. One filled, one empty. So you'll also have an empty one. Because filled is a different weight than empty, of course. So, you know, the plastic itself could be one pound, you know, close enough. And then you replace the empty cylinder with a filled cylinder, and now you've got two pounds, okay? Now, replace the filled cylinder with an empty cylinder again and put one cylinder on each end. Now you've got three pounds, okay? Um, re again, replace that center cylinder with a filled cylinder. Now you've got four pounds, okay? Um, go back to an empty cylinder and all four of these cylinders filled. Now you've got five pounds, and now refill the center cylinder. No, not, not refill it. Replace it with the filled one again. And now you've got almost six pounds. So theoretically, this will go from like one, roughly, approximately. Now, they're not going to be exactly one pound, two pound, three pound. It's going to be, you know, 0.9 pounds. And then the next set's going to be, you know, 2.1 pounds. It's going to be close enough. You're going to be making in incremental increases in weight that are roughly one pound each. Because I couldn't make these cylinders one pound. It has to be this big be one pound and that big is too big because um what happens is um your your hand starts bumping into these other cylinders um so to avoid that i had to limit how big i made these cylinders so they're about um three percent too small to be a pound see you later colin thank you again for the paypal i appreciate that makes a big difference <laughs> My water bill is 53 bucks. You just paid my water bill, dude. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to keep... Now, one of the other objectives is to make sure anybody can print this. So that means no part can be larger than 210 millimeters. 
That's limited by the Prusa, which has a 210 millimeter vertical axis. Um, so every single part is 210 millimeters or smaller. Actually, the wishbones, you can print two of them simultaneously, so you don't have to print them one at a time. Um, but by doing that, anybody with any printer, for the most part, can print this. Um, and you can do it cheaply. So it's something that you can afford to donate, you know, a couple of sets, you know, spend 30 bucks on plastic. Or hell, if you make it a project, you might be able to get a filament manufacturer to donate it to you. You know, as long as you, um, um, you know, you know, point out that the, um, you're sponsored by so-and-so, you know, um, you know, for your local such-and-such -such community center or because you know these community centers as well. Some towns have local community centers with basic exercise equipment that their older patients use. Um, you could donate a few sets to a place like that or to a local physical therapy center. Um, the idea wouldn't be for the physical therapy center to use them. The idea would be this is something the physical therapy center could give to the patient. Okay, you can't afford to go buy a set, so here, take this. One of our local residents donated this to us. You can have it. Here's how you use it. And now they have a dumbbell. They didn't have to go buy one. And I gotta add some text so I can see your message. Would be cool if you make the end of the holder into C clip shapes. Um, no, C clips aren't gonna work. Because um, C clips and plastic don't work. <laughs> the the pressure point's too high, way too high. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm doing this. Let me show you. So we have compression taken care of because these two center ones are more than enough to compress this and hold everything together. But it wiggles, okay? So when I don't have caps on here, it wiggles. So here's how we're stopping the wiggle. Um. We're doing this. See here? So now we have our beveled easy insert edge. So we get our three dimensional interface because this is a cone. And about half of this will interface. Okay? And then you have these little fins. These fins will interface these slots. That's going to stop the wiggle. Now it won't wiggle. And I retain vase mode compatibility. And I retain invertibility. So this piece can be inverted. Both sides are the same, see? I could probably optimize this a little more. Heck, I could probably just make the cylinders a tiny bit bigger. And that would do it too. But um, this invertibility would take care of the creep issue. So now, if, you're, if you do print a set out of, for your own self, not to give away to somebody else... If you print a set, if you're, if you're going to give it away, please use PETG. It's just a much more durable plastic for this type of function. Um, but you can, um, if you decide to use PLA, which will creep over time, that's okay. When these, when these ends become loose, you just flip it over and screw it back down again. It'll act as a spring and actually stay compressed. And when it creeps the other way, you just flip it over again. And you just keep flipping as often as you need. You'll probably, if I had to guess, I'd say every six months you might have to flip it. Maybe once a year. It depends on how often you take it apart and put it together. But I would estimate that maybe once every six months or once a year, you'll probably have to flip the wishbones because they'll have crept if you use PLA. Um, PETG, once a year or never. It depends on um, the stability of the plastic. <clears throat> so... Now I have this taken care of. What I have to do next is take care of this. What I'm probably going to do is, first thing I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to make this cylinder shorter and make these threads bigger. Since we're no longer using soda caps, I'm no longer restricted to that size. So I can now make the caps bigger. There's no reason not to make the caps bigger now that I can. Oh, here's my cap right there. So D. Uh, duplicate. So now there's no reason I I can't make the cap bigger. Um, and bigger will be easier for the person to handle, and also stronger. The threads will be a little bit deeper, and the um the overall object interface will be greater. So now you won't have this thin neck 
which is a weak point. I can just make that neck as thick as this, basically. Um, I could also stretch the threads out. As long as I stretch both parts out equally, it's not going to care. Um, as long as I proportionally adjust the size of both parts together, it should work just fine. In fact, I might even be able to use my own threads that I designed for my um, model rocket um, end caps my, for my motor retention. Because I have some pretty good design threads for that. They're stronger. A lot stronger. <laughs> um, I'll have to see if they're vase mode compatible. But if those threads are vase mode compatible, I'll probably use those on this. Um, that'll make a much stronger piece, a much stronger unit. And then um, the trick will be to make sure the interface... Actually, what I'll probably do... Oh, why didn't I think of that? Of course, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to make the center cylinder have the same exact tabbed cap as I have now. Why not? No, I can't. I can't do that because then I can't have the... Okay, the reason, the whole reason that we're tabbing the pink bottles, the whole reason that we're tabbing the pink bottles um, to, to stop that twist and not just tabbing the center is because I can only tab one side of the center. I can't tab both sides. See, if I want to tab this, it's easy. All I have to do is have the tab come up right here. And there'll, you'll, there'll be a little tab right there. No problem. Easy, right? Easy peasy, yummy squeezy, right? No issues. Well, the problem is you can't do this side <laughs> because the tab can't touch the plate. Because if the tab touches the plate, it's inside the threads. So I can't do that. Um, the only way I might be able to do that is to make the bottom part not vase mode up to here and have built in supports here. But basically, a ring around here. Nice big thick ring. Ding, 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 ding. And then the the tabs will print on top of the ring. And then you just snip it off. But no, screw that. That's a pain in the ass. I, I can be more efficient than that. I don't want I don't want there to be any post-processing work. I don't want the end users to have to do anything. They're doing a favor. They're making these for free for somebody. I don't want them to have to do any work. So I want these parts to be ready to use off the print bed like this is. None of this, there's no post-processing. With the exception, with the exception of Filling it with sand and sealing the end. There's no post-processing work to do this. Um, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is print the parts, thread them together, you're done. And I want to keep that, so I don't want any trimming, cutting, clipping, melting, gluing. I want to try to avoid all that if, I, if at all possible. Um, let's see what else. In theory, someone suggested using internal threads and then printing a small plug that would thread into the um, to the cylinder to seal the end. Um, wait a minute. This has internal threads. Because it's vase mode printed. Because that's vase mode printed, there's basically an inverse of the threads on the inside. I would have to extend the threads all the way to the lip, because you need a start point, you need an entry point for the thread to go in. But, that might not be as hard as I thought. I mean, the, I mean, printing the plug would be trial and error. Because I can't model it. Because it's, it's generated by G-code. Those internal threads aren't in the model. Those internal threads are G-code generated. By the vase mode process. But theoretically I can get close. Um, to what it needs to be. And then just keep scaling it. Print it, scale it, print it. It'd be a pain in the ass. But I, I'd only have to do it once. You know, Once I got the right size, that's it, I'm done. Because now I can just print that over and over and over again. That might be doable. I might be able to make a plug, a little cylinder that you print that would thread into here um, to keep the sand in without having to use glue. I'm not going to prioritize that right now because it is easy enough just to glue the ends. That's something I can always just, I can update the model files later. 
Later on, I can say, okay, I figured out how to make the end without using glue. Here you go. You print these five caps. Then the, um, screw them in. You know, the end user, depending on how they print it, they might have to tweak it a little bit. Print one, see if it fits. If it fits, then go. If not, yeah, that theoretic, but I would have to make the, see right now the threads, they terminate right there. So the, you can't access the threads from the outside. The thread has to go all the way to the lip. Um, so basically I have to cut off this top part of the lip here. I have to make, add a few more threads to this and then um, clip off that, um, that part on the top there to, um, so that the thread goes all the way to the edge. The, 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 the start point of the thread needs to be outside the model so that there's an opening for you to put the part in. But yeah, that could work. That actually could work. Just modeling interior threads like that, that's a pain in the th It's such a pain. Oh my god. Usually the way I do it is I, I, I make my threaded part and then I, I stretch it a little bit and widen it a little bit and I use it as a cut tool to cut the threads into whatever part I'm doing. And then I tweak and adjust it until it threads properly. Um, that's how I usually do it because it's, it's modeling it's, well, in Tinkercad. Modeling threads like that is a real pain in the ass. Um, the, but the problem is for 3D printing, especially because I do vase mode printing a lot. Um, oh no, that won't work. Nope, 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 nope. That won't work. Nope, it won't work at all. Because it would only work if you printed vase mode and only work if you use the same nozzle size I'm using. So if I modeled it for this, it would only work for you if you were using a one millimeter nozzle in vase mode printing. Because as soon as you were using a, say, a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, for example, and I said, okay, over extrude to 0.5 millimeters and print two walls. This way you have the same one millimeter wall thickness. The problem is your interior is not going to be the inverse of these threads. Your interior is going to be a smooth cylinder. <laughs> so the, the, the threads would have to actually be modeled. Um, that might not be so bad because I could vase mode print the whole thing and then just switch to non-vase mode printing just for this section. Now, the problem is I would have to slice the files for you, and I would have to provide G-code because no, only Simplify 3D can do that. Only Simplify 3D can print vase mode and then switch to regular mode. Do a two-perimeter print up here. Um, only Simplify 3D can do that. Prusa Slicer won't do it. Um, 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 Cura won't do it. Orca Slicer won't do it. Um, what's the other one? The um, Idea Maker won't do it. Um, as far as I know, no other slicer will allow you to just switch back and forth between layers and phase mode. Um, so it would work for the 0.4 millimeter print. I could just model the threads in. That's easy. I can do that. But for the um, um, but for the phase mode version, if you're using a one millimeter nozzle, and if you want to make a lot of these, you're going to want to use the one millimeter phase mode model because it prints a hell of a lot faster. Um, it prints um, almost three times faster than the 0.4 millimeter nozzle print. Um, because, well, think about it this way. I mean, when I'm drawing layers, and I'm drawing those layers at 0.6 millimeters thick, so that's um, even, using, a, using max, um, you're not going to be able to go to maximum, but, you know, like, for example, if you were printing at, you know, 90 millimeters a second, Okay, um, I have to print the threads at 0.2 millimeter, but the cylinder I could print at 0.6 millimeter. I'm using a one millimeter nozzle. And in fact, I could probably get away with 0.8 millimeter. That that curve is so gentle, I could probably get I could probably go 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.2. So this section of the model, I'd be printing um, four times, four times, two, eight times. I'll be printing eight times faster than you will. <laughs> the speed difference is ungodly. Uh, you know, you know, I'm only printing at you know 20 millimeters a second. 
but my maximum speed is usually around 28 millimeters a second. I use volumetric throughput on my calculated volumetric throughput, which is one thing that Prusa Slicer is fantastic for. Um, but by by restricting my volumetric flow rate to the 10 cubic millimeters a second that PETG Max is at, um, I usually end up printing at about 24 to 28 millimeters a second. You might think that seems slow, right? Except that when I print one single layer, so when my nozzle does this, your nozzle has to do this. Um, your nozzle has to complete that circuit eight times to lay down the same amount of plastic as I lay down doing one circle. <laughs> so even though I'm only going 28 millimeters a second, even if you were printing at 100 millimeters a second, I'm still printing three times faster than you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Fat nozzles are amazing. It's just, it's, I, I, I print one of these in less than two hours. <laughs> and I, and um, I'm pretty sure with Simplified 3D, I can get down to about like an hour and 15 minutes. To print one of these. That, that's fast. It's one millimeter thick. It's watertight. <laughs> it holds water. Um, so fat nozzles are just sick. It, it's just, I love printing fat nozzles. And you can print fine details. You know, those threads printed just fine. I had to modify the threads to make them vase mode compatible because they were not vase mode compatible. They had hard overhangs that I had to get rid of. But, um, if you can, um, if you can model the part to be compatible with a one millimeter extrusion and a vase mode print, you, know, you can make ridiculously strong parts that print ridiculously fast, even though the nozzles, even though your print head's going. You're thinking, how can that be fast? And ten minutes later, you got a quarter of the model done because <laughs> you're just you're just laying down so much plastic. And this is slowing down to 10 cubic millimeters a second for PETG. That's the maximum speed you can print PETG. PLA, you can go to 15 cubic millimeters a second. So you can print 50% faster. Although I find out you don't get the full 50% speed increase when um, printing fat like this. And it's actually not because it can't extrude the plastic fast enough. That's part of the problem. It's cooling. Most printers just do not have adequate cooling for dropping that much plastic that thick onto the printer. The, the plastic itself retains so much heat. Exactly. It can't, it can't zap. You know, uh, you're, you're basically, you're, you're, you're Mr. Freeze. You know, print a layer, zip, zap, and you freeze it with your freeze gun. And that, that's, that's basically how a 3D printer works. It's, it's trying to zap that plastic into a solid state um, before it has a chance to droop. And um, when you're printing 0.2, thick, 0.2 millimeter thick layers, you're not laying down, even, even if you're going fast, you're laying down such a thin layer of plastic that the air is able to hit it and cool it. Um, but when you're laying down a 0.8 millimeter thick layer of plastic, you might cool the surface, but all the plastic below it that's still molten is, well, it's still molten. And your prints get, start getting sloppy because they stay soft. They don't have a chance to harden. Um, so a lot of the times you can't, even with PLA, you can't realize it's full speed potential. Because you're just laying down so much plastic so quickly. Uh, uh. The other advantage of vase mode is that it's, it's error proof. Um... Assuming the part is correctly designed for vase mode, and assuming the correct vase mode settings were put into the slicer, um, as long as that first layer sticks, as long as that first layer sticks to the bed and doesn't move, the part is error-proof. It, it essentially can't fail. Because failure comes with change. If there's no change, the probability of failure is very, very low. Your, your probability of failure climbs exponentially the more changes you add. Well, what's a change? A change is a retraction, a restart, a layer change, a perimeter change, an infill change, a travel movement, 
All of those things are changes. With a vase mode print, there are no changes. It's one continuous, non-stop extrusion. There isn't even any layers. It's a continuous corkscrew. Yeah, but clog is... And, and Mac, vase mode reduces the probability of a clog. <laughs> I mean, clogs usually happen. Retract, something gets stuck, something cools down too much, push, you're clogged. Okay? So vase mode even reduces the probability of a clog. In fact, with some of my bigger printers, I can even print without hot end cooling. I can have no fans on the hot end. Because I'm pushing through so much plastic, that, and it's a continuous push of plastic. It never stops. The plastic is just continuously pushing that the, the heat creep never has a chance to soften the plastic on the top end. You know, it never retracts and the plastic sits there in the hotter cooling vent and it never has a chance to heat creep. It's not reliable. You know, I've had it fail a few times. But there's one time I needed to print it. I was like, let's try it without it. I said, fuck it, just go. And it worked. It, the, the, the hot end fan wasn't working. And, and I had no parts cooling fan. I'm, I don't really use parts cooling on the big prints. Um, but yeah, the, no fans. And it worked. Now, of course, as, as soon as it stopped and tried to do something, instant clog. You know, because it's going to heat creep the hell out of it. Um, you know, especially pushing 240 degrees on the hot end, but, um, the combination of how cool the house is and, and pushing so much plastic through the nozzle that the plastic itself was acting as a heat sink is absorbing the heat, you know, and, and you say, well, it's going to soften. Oh, it doesn't have a chance. It's being pushed through so fast. It doesn't have a chance to soften up. It just keeps going, keeps going. Move along, soldier. Move along. Keep going. <laughs> but, um. But yeah, vase mode reduces the failure probability of just about every failure mode. Now, I mean, obviously, if you have a thermistor failure or a heater coupler failure or something like that, you know, obviously nothing's going to solve that. Um, but most failures are either eliminated, and even the failures that aren't eliminated, their probability is reduced when you're, when you're both doing vase mode and doing fat noodle printing. Because that helps as well. Um, you know, obviously with a uh, 0.4 nozzle, there's more failure um, possibilities. So the thicker the nozzle, the lower the failure possibilities. But um, yeah, that's the idea. As, as long as that first layer sticks. Now, of course, with Facebook, if that first layer fails, you're screwed. Because <laughs> you only have, the only thing touching the bed is the first layer. That's it. So if that first layer fails, you're boned. That's why I do closed end. Because that increases the contact patch for that first layer. Because it's such a small contact patch. It's one of the reasons why I'm going to redo the threads and make the threads bigger. Because um, there's um, um, the bigger threads will be more reliable, easier to print, easier to thread, larger contact patch with the print bed. Everything's better with the bigger threads. So now that I'm now I, I the only reason I kept these threads is because that's what I started with. But now I realize that since I'm not using bottle caps anymore. There's nothing keeping me to that size thread. I can make it as big as I want. So I'm going to make it as big as the cylinder, which will make it a hell of a lot easier to print. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it. You know, the, the, it just, the, vase mode is nice for the end user, you know, especially if I design in the files properly, as long as I do it correctly, as long as they follow the instructions. For example, with this particular print, the threaded sections have to be 0.2 millimeter layer height. If you try to use a larger layer height, those threads are not going to print right. It's not. That's too fine a detail. A 0.4, maybe. I don't know. I'll have to try it. But the overhang with a 0.4 is pretty high. Um, your, your probability of failure is much, much higher. Also, with vase mode prints like this, my first layer is always fat. The first layer of every one of these prints is 0.6 millimeters thick. I then switch immediately to 0.2 millimeters, but the first layer is 0.6. And the fatter the first layer, the lower the probability of it first not sitting correctly on the bed, and second, of it popping off. That fat third layer, first layer, is a goopy molten plastic that's just got a better probability of sticking to the bed, even if your bed leveling's off a little bit. By having that first... And, I, and also, I usually... I could do this in Simplify 3D. I cannot do this in Rooster Slicer. At least I haven't figured out how to yet. I usually over-extrude the first layer by 
So I make the first layer 0.6 and I increase the flow rate to 2. So that first layer, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to lay down and it's going to print. That's why they're beveled. For example, you know, when I print these, that's one of the main reasons I bevel like this is so that you don't notice the elephant's foot. It just looks like it's part of the bevel. Or if you, you do have a part that, like on this one here, it's beveled so that if you have to insert the part over extruding that first layer, doesn't screw up your fit and finish. So I always try to bevel my bed interface layer so that I can just over extrude the fuck out of that first layer. And your, your bed level, your whole bed could be like, eh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to go, Boof, I don't care. <laughs> you know, when you drop that amount of plastic, <coughs> it's just going to stick no matter what. You, so you get more reliable first layer, even if it's not perfect, and you get a better stick on the first layer. And as long as that first layer sticks, now, obviously, if your printer has mechanical problems where the parts are shifting, and so you have nozzle crashing, that's reduced with vase mode, but not eliminated. Um, but that's a mechanical problem. I mean, I can only compensate for so much, okay? <laughs> I'm not a miracle worker. I just, I'm, just, I'm an engineer. I make things easier. But um, um, by going vase mode, there's just such a low probability of failure as long as the part is correctly designed that um, your, your probability of success is dramatically increased. Facebook good. <laughs> now, of course, because we're not doing water anymore, on water, you really need to use phase mode. I mean, theoretically, if you over-extrude, you have multiple perimeters, you can usually get a normal print to be waterproof. But if you really want a waterproof print, you really want to be using phase mode. Um, and people think, well, phase mode, flimsy and thin. I mean, I'm squeezing that as hard as I can. That's one perimeter. But it's one millimeter thick. You'd have to do three walls to get that thickness. Um, is, is your three wall print weak? Well, then your one millimeter vase mode print won't be weak. So, fat nozzles are fun, man! <laughs> I, I, I think everybody needs to have one printer with a one millimeter nozzle on it. It's just so much you can do, and it's flexible. You can over extrude to 1.2, you can under extrude down to 0.8, no problem. In fact, um, 0.8 millimeter nozzles are really good size. As long as you get a 0.8 with a flat tip, and not a pointy tip, because a 0.8 will allow you to print 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1 using one nozzle. You can usually go up or down 0.2 with minimal difficulty. Um, but the bigger your nozzle, the easier it is to do that, because 0.2 is a smaller percentage of a bigger nozzle. 0 0.2 is 25% of a 0.8-millimeter of a, of a nozzle, but it's 50% of a 0.4-millimeter nozzle. See what I mean? So 0.8 millimeter is a really nice size because you can print one millimeter extrusions if you want. Although your overhangs might not be as pretty if you have some extreme overhangs. Meaning there are, there are cases where a one millimeter nozzle will extrude a one millimeter overhang that is superior to a 0.8 millimeter nozzle over extruding to one millimeter. Because you're, um, it's about pressure distribution, a bunch of different things, but... For most people, a 0.8 millimeter nozzle is a really optimal size because you can print reasonably strong stuff that's not super heavy at 0.8 millimeters. You can over extrude a little bit to one millimeter and get those super strong vase mode parts. And you can under extrude to 0.6 millimeter with a minimal loss of detail. And now you are small enough that you can do 95% of what your 0.4 millimeter nozzle could do. You know, most of the time, the only time you need the detail of a 0.4 millimeter nozzle is when you're printing small stuff like this. Oh, wait a minute. This was printed with a one millimeter nozzle. <laughs> so you'd be surprised what you can get away with. Now, if you're printing uh, a Picasso statue, Da Vinci kind of thing with lots of little tiny details. You're printing that beautiful articulated dragon, really small. Okay, you need a 0.4. Nothing can, nothing can correct that kind of resolution need besides using a small nozzle. But 99% of the stuff we print does not require that kind of resolution. 
just doesn't need it. The only reason I even print things like my rocket parts with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle is for mass. If I printed this with a 0.6 millimeter nozzle, it would absolutely be substantially stronger. It would also be 50% heavier because it would use 50% more plastic. So you're paying for that strength with mass. And because this is a flight model, this thing, this thing flies, that mass is important to me. If this were a display model, fuck that shit. It'd be 0.6 millimeter all the way around. I wouldn't even care. Right? And most of the stuff we print is not an engineering print. It's not performing a function. So mass doesn't matter. If it's 50% heavier, it really doesn't matter. And it's usually small enough that the cost doesn't matter. You know? Now, I mean, yeah, sure, if you're using a really expensive filament, it might be an issue. But most of us aren't. So I tell people, get a 0.8 millimeter nozzle. And now you can use 0.6 to do your really fine printing. And you can use 1 millimeter to do your um, super strong printing. And you can use 0.8 for stuff that's in between. And this justifies the purchase of a $100 printer nozzle. Uh, Diamondback nozzles. They're $95 each. Okay? They're expensive. There's, there's no question. They're expensive as fuck. Would I buy a $95.4 millimeter nozzle? No, I would not. I would not spend, I would, I would have difficulty spending $95 of my own money for a 0 0.4 millimeter nozzle, although I know there are some of you out there who could absolutely use it. And the reason is, um, I would not want to lose the nozzle to a clog. I have had a filament that had an impurity in it. Something was in it. And the nozzle clogged so hard that even using an Allen key as a punch and hitting it with a hammer, I could not get whatever was jammed inside that nozzle out. It was done. The nozzle was destroyed. If that happened to a $95 nozzle, I'd lose my shit and blow my cap. <laughs> but at 0.8 millimeters, nothing is jamming inside that nozzle. Nothing is going to jam in that nozzle that you can't remove. Okay? All the wood filament you want, don't care. All the carbon filament you want, don't care. You're not hard jamming. You might soft jam, but you're never going to hard jam that nozzle to the point where you can't undo it. Uh, no, this was a foreign material. It wasn't jammed with plastic. There was a piece of metal or rock or ceramic or something in the filament, and that's what's jammed in there. Whatever is jammed in there is a hell of a lot harder than PLA. I'm telling you, I, I, it's the, um, I have it here somewhere. Where is it? It's, it's not even the nozzle. It's the throat for the fucking heat break. It's the heat break throat. Oh, I have it here somewhere. I don't know where it's at. It's in pieces. I tore apart the whole entire hot end. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a stainless steel tube. The, the, the heat break that goes to the, the all metal heat break that goes to the nozzle. Something got jammed inside the, the heat break. And... I put a Allen key, a 1.5 millimeter Allen key, down inside the heat break and hit the end with a hammer. It did not budge. Whatever's in there is permanent. It's not coming out. Probably the only way I'm going to be able to get that out of there would be to get a super fine, get a pair of God hands. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this to a pair of God hands because you're going to destroy your fucking God hands doing this. But you get a pair of, you know, if you're rich and you don't care and you don't mind blowing a pair of God hands on it, you take your God hands and you cut that tube and you split it open. And then you might be able to get out whatever's in there. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll ruin your God hands, but, you know, <laughs> you're rich, okay? So you don't care. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, whatever's in there, it's, 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 it's staying. It's, it's, it's stuck. Um, so I'm guessing it has to be metal or mineral. So a piece of ceramic, a piece of stone, rock, metal, filing, something. Something was inside the filament. There's a contaminant inside the filament. It just fucking done. <laughs> so, um, but at 0.8 millimeters, nothing is going to be in that filament that's going to jam a 0.8 millimeter nozzle to where you can't poke it out. Okay. So now you, you're you've you're not going to destroy it accidentally. So you're not going to lose your hundred bucks. But that nozzle is essentially indestructible. The tip of the nozzle is got a superior attachment than the ruby nozzles so you're not going to have to worry about the pcd tip coming out that's never happened yet um 
The PCD is polycrystalline diamond. Now that's important. A ruby nozzle is a monocrystalline ruby. That's why it's clear. Monocrystallines, all the, um, the cleavage lines, all the layers of crystal are aligned the same way. So it's a perfect layer. That's why a ruby is transparent. That's why a ruby nozzle, you can see through it. Okay. Now, if you look at the diamondback nozzle, it's, it's polycrystalline diamond. Okay? That means all the layers are intermingled and twisted together. Um, for jewelry, that's bad. We want that crystal clarity for jewelry. But the problem is monocrystallines can cleave. I mean, think about this. They make a gem out of a diamond for your ring. If the only thing that can cut a diamond is a diamond or something harder than a diamond, how do they cut diamonds? How do they do that? Especially before modern technology. How do they cut diamonds? They don't. You don't cut diamonds. Um, monocrystals are perfect alignments of crystals. And those crystals have what's called cleavage points. There are points where two perfect crystals can be separated. You're not actually cutting it. You're separating two halves of a perfect crystal. And professionals, people, artisans who know how to do this can hit it in such a way as to cause a cleavage where they want to give you the shape of the gem. Um, and that is bad for 3D printing. You ever seen somebody ram a ruby nozzle into the print bed and shatter the ruby? <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> well, that's because it's a monocrystal. And it hit the print bed the right way, hit that cleavage line, and there it goes. There goes your crystal. Because the diamond back is a polycrystalline diamond, you don't have that problem. There's no cleavage lines. So you have the strength of a diamond without the brittleness of a crystal. Which means it's literally as close as you can get to indestructible. The only way for them to make a more indestructible nozzle would be for them to press the entire nozzle out of polycrystalline diamond instead of brass with a diamond insert. That would be the only way they can make it stronger is by making the whole thing out of polycrystalline diamond. Um, so you're as close to indestructible as you're ever going to get. The thermal properties of the polycrystalline diamond is superior in every possible way optimized for 3D printing. It has better thermal conduction, better thermal transfer, better thermal retention. So that means it absorbs, keeps, and moves heat better and more efficiently than any other material, including the king of metals for thermal conductivity, copper. We don't make nozzles out of copper for two reasons. One, they corrode. Two, copper is soft. Okay? Copper is very soft. That's why we use brass. Brass is an amalgamation of copper, tin, and, a couple, and lead, and a couple other things. Right? So, and you lose, so brass is not as conductive as copper, but it's almost as conductive. It's pretty close. You lose some conductivity, but you gain hardness. But even brass is still a pretty soft metal, but it's a lot harder than um, copper. And it's also a lot easier to keep brass from eroding, tarnishing. That's that green color that forms on copper. You don't want that inside your nozzle. It's going to be really bad. Because not only is it going to change the physical attributes of your nozzle, but it's going to change the drag characteristics, heat conduction, everything. Ah, okay, cool. I didn't know there was a word for that. I, I, for some reason, I thought it was called cleaving. You're using a cleavage line. <laughs> um, but that doesn't make sense because we have a cleaver for meat cutting. Yeah, brooding, huh? Cool. Um, so, by being polycrystalline, you're now not only using the hardest known material that can be used for that function, but it's now not brittle because it's polycrystalline. Um, really, that's cool. That's an interesting trait to, uh, what do you call it, a skill to have. That's a really interesting skill to have. But, um, so it's got, it's better hardness, it's Better um, toughness. It's the, as tough as it's possible to get. There's no other nozzle that's tougher. Even an A2 tool steel hardened nozzle is nowhere near as tough or as hard 
has a polycrystalline diamond nozzle. It's got better heat properties in every single metric, superior even to copper. It's also got better lubricity, which means it's slipperier. Slippery is good because, you know, the, the material of the nozzle drags on the filament as it comes out. And um, you'll, you'll see that happen where, especially with silk filaments, where they bunch up on the end of the nozzle. And um, sometimes PETG actually prefers to stick to your fucking nozzle rather than stick to your bed. How many here have had that happen where the fucking PETG just keeps curling up on the nozzle instead of sticking to the bed? <laughs> oh, that's such a pain in the ass. PETG is only a problem for the first layer. After the first layer, it basically prints like PLA. But yeah, that's a pain in the ass. Well, that's an advantage of nozzles like um, the Nozzle X, the Ruby. I don't know if the Ruby has better lubricity or not. I don't know if it has better lubricity. And the Polycrystalline Diamond nozzles have better lubricity, which means PETG doesn't want to stick to it as much. It might still, but it'll be less prone to it. You're going to be less likely to goober up um, plastic on the nozzle. This is also beneficial for artistic prints. For example, I love printing the, um, um, what are they called? Um, when you print layers and then you shine it in the light and you see a picture. They used to make them out of porcelain. They used to chip them out of porcelain. What's it called when you do that? I forgot the name of it. I can't remember the name of it, but anyway. <coughs> lithophane, yes. Lithophane is the word I was looking for. Um, you ever try to print one with PETG? And every now and then the fucking nozzle drops a molten, burned up goober on top of your goddamn print and it messes up your lithophane? Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> That's why I don't use PETG for lithophanes. Because of that, it drops goobers into your model. You know, little wisps of plastic that get stuck to the brass. And it cooks off, and once it's large enough for gravity to have it fall off, it drops that fucking goober into your lithophane. I hate that so much. That's less likely to happen with a PCD nozzle. And, of course, the toughness and hardness are off the charts, which means you can shove as much carbon fiber, glass fiber, or glow-in-the-dark filament through this as you want, and it's going to say, is that the best you got? <laughs> the nozzle's amazing. I love their nozzles. I mean, I only got a little set of them, and I can't afford to buy any more, but I still talk them up anytime I get a chance because they're amazing. They really are amazing. And a 0.8 millimeter nozzle is an optimal size because you can print high-res 0.6 millimeter details, middle-of-the-ground 0.8, or slightly sloppy one millimeter extrusions all from one nozzle that's why 0.8 is such a nice size and it'll be the last nozzle you ever have to buy it's not going to get damaged if you accidentally crash it into your glass plate it's not going to get damaged putting glow in the dark or carbon fiber through it it's just not going to care and because it's a 0.8 it's never going to jam to where you can't just poke it and unjam it you know so you don't have to worry about it self-destructing or anything it's literally the last nozzle you will ever have to buy for that printer period I mean, I mean, is, is it guaranteed to last forever? No, of course not. But I cannot think of a way for you to kill it. I cannot think of a way for you to kill that nozzle unless you're doing it on purpose. Unless you intend to kill that nozzle. Okay, if you put a brick on your plate and tell the printer to scratch that nozzle across the brick, I think it'll still handle it for a little while, but that will probably kill it eventually. Um... Because bricks have some ceramics in it, which means some of the particles in there are hard enough to damage the polycrystalline diamond. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's just really an incredible nozzle. And they have volcanoes now, too. But yeah, I would, I would love for them to make a solid polycrystalline nozzle, like the whole nozzle, polycrystalline. I think they have the, I think they have the accuracy to do that, but it would cost a fortune. <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not only a workhorse, it's not only tough and damn near indestructible, it's superior in every possible metric. There isn't a single metric where any other nozzle is superior to this one except one, and that's price tag. That's it, price tag. 
you know, thermal um, metrics, all three thermal metrics, superior than any other material we could possibly use. You know, toughness and hardness, superior to every other material we could possibly use. Lubricity, on par with any other material we could use. There's just, there's nothing better. Only problem is the $100 price tag. <laughs> <coughs> you can save 50 bucks if you buy the three-pack. It's like $250, I think, for the three-pack. We get three of them. So if you're going to upgrade a few printers and you've got the money burning a hole in your pocket, you can save around 50 bucks by buying the three-pack. But um, I'm still surprised they don't sell it direct cheaper. Because if they're selling it for $95 on Amazon, they can sell it direct to you for 75 or 80 bucks and make the same amount of money because of the overhead Amazon charges. Amazon charges about 30%. Which means they, they're, they're actually only getting about $70, $75 from each nozzle from Amazon when they sell it. Um, although, I don't know if they drop ship. Like, do they use Amazon FBA or is it direct ship from U.S. Metal? Um, that might save them a little bit on the Amazon overhead. But, um, yeah, they're, they're truly a phenomenal... Where is my mouse? There it is. It's truly a phenomenal nozzle. I mean, it's really, really impressive. I, I like their stuff. And I like promoting companies that make good stuff. And it's really nice when it's an American company. <laughs> I mean, sure, there's not a whole lot of labor involved in making nozzles out of a machine. You know, they, they, what, they use a, what, a million pounds per square inch of pressure at 2,500 degrees to make those nozzles. <laughs> they have these little chambers that are about this big. And that, that, that limits the size of what they can make. So they could almost, they could just about make something the size of a benchy. Um, but it has to fit inside that little chamber because that little chamber has to be able to handle 1 million pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure plus 2,500 degrees. Was it Fahrenheit or Celsius? It might have been Celsius. I don't know. Very, very high temperatures to work with that stuff. Um, so that's why they can't just like, you know, make a car control horn out of PCD. It, it, it cost you millions to make the tooling to make the part. Um, so they can only make very small things, and um, that's part of the reason why they only make the tip of the nozzle out of PCD, because for ninety nine percent of the work, there's no need to, for the rest of the nozzle to be PCD, and it also allows them to make you know probably put like six or seven of them in there or something like that to make them. Well, if they made an entire nozzle, they'd probably only be able to fit one or two in there. Um, but yeah, that's. It's pretty phenomenal stuff. I, I like talking about them. It's, they're, they're, they're pretty phenomenal things. Um, so I think what I'm going to do... Huh. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same tube for the center and then just add the threads to the end of it. But I have to get rid of the veins. So if I if I use the exact if I make all three the exact same tube, then it'll work. This. So we need to make this. Okay, so I can I can do this. I can make this work. Is this the one that's already two ten? I think this is the one that's already two ten. Come on, stop grabbing other stuff. Can't you work with me for once? You see how this fucks with me? That's 197. So I need to make that bigger. I need to raise it up 13 millimeters. 13. Okay. That gets me to 10. So let's go back again. <coughs> One ninety seven. Let's take just these two pieces and raise them thirteen millimeters. Twelve machines, nice dude. Yeah, I remember running a dozen fifteen machines at a time. I can't do that here. I don't got enough power. <laughs> okay. How big is this? This is twenty. 20, 
So that's um, 190, 170. So this needs to be 170. 170. That is not what I typed in. Dumbass. 170. And we put a work plane here. Drop this down to zero. Come on, work with me. Down to zero. Then we align. That should be good. Center, center. Okay, so that's that one. Now what I need to do is make the center one exactly the same thing, but shorten this a little bit without the veins and add the threads. And that will keep the interface between all of these parts identical. And as long as the interface is identical, we're good for length. Oh, I'm sorry. I I wasn't there. So um, the problem I have is that these need to all be where they interface with the tubes needs to be identical. Otherwise, these will be loose or these will be being squeezed too tight. I need the force to be as even as possible. So the solution is actually pretty easy. Just make them all identical. No, make the center one the same as the outside ones and then add my threads to it. So what I'm going to do is for the center one, I'm going to get rid of the veins. I'm going to get rid of this little beveled section here so that the center one is a little bit shorter. The shoulder, the part that interfaces with the print, the wishbone will be the same. But this will be a little bit shorter and then the threads will be added on top of this. What that's going to do is allow... Um, allow the, the nuts to compress. Uh, it'll allow you to squeeze tight enough to compress. And it'll also keep the shoulder interface identical. So I won't have to worry about the um, the interface line changing. So that means I need to make a new one of these. So let's go um, uh, duplicate. So that's going to be pretty easy. Split. Now I just get rid of this. And get rid of this. And now I need to shorten this a little bit. Actually, we already got the bevel. The bevel's already gone. Um, so I just need to shorten that a little bit. So let's make it two millimeters shorter. Uh, is two millimeters enough? I think two millimeters is enough. So two millimeters. And join that. Okay, so now this is the cut tool that I need to use for the center. Because um, I did make it bigger, right? Yes, I made it 0.2 millimeters bigger. So control D, rotate 180, but lower it down to zero. Zero. Join them together. And now turn it into a hole and center it on this one. Center it there. Bingo, bango. Why did you do that? I hate when it does that. It deselected the part. Okay, now I can get rid of this one. Stop. Now I can take this. It should this should be centered on these? It's not. Let's fix that. Now it's centered, and now I can join. Okay, the wishbone is done. So that's the new wishbone. And if I want to try taking a little plastic off of this, I can do that. Uh, if I shave two and a half millimeters off of both sides. That won't change the interface, but it'll make it lighter. So I can make two versions of this, a light version and a heavy-duty version. And we can see which one works better. So that's very easy. All I have to do is do this. Drop a cut tool here like this. Okay. That's actually 20 millimeters. So let's just duplicate that and make one of these 2.5 millimeters. And then make the other one also 2.5 millimeters, but from this side, 
There we go. And now I can make the whole thing five millimeters thinner, meaning we're back down to 15 millimeters again, which means we should be back down to around 85 grams. And um, without losing my, my identical interlocking interface. So the interfaces will still work perfectly, but this one will be, that should be 15 millimeters. 14.99, close enough. So 15 millimeters or 20 millimeters. Oh, that's because this is lifted up. That's right. There we go. Now you can see the size difference. So um, maybe we'll find out that um, 15 millimeters is thick enough, and I can save some plastic that way, um, especially being able to flip it over. Um, being able to flip it over um, eliminates a lot of the issues that I have, because now if it does warp, you just flip it. Um, but if I want to print it thicker, I can do that. I can even go thinner if I want to, but you're going to... You're, you're, if you get rid of too much of this shoulder, your interface is going to be bad. And you're going to start applying pressure. You're going to start cracking it. I would much rather have this thicker interface here. So I'm probably going to go with the 20 millimeter one. But if, if this will get me to 340 grams, I might give it a shot. Um, but only if I think that's going to get me to my 340 grams. If I'm still going to be over 340 grams, then it doesn't really matter whether I'm 340, 400, or 450. So this would only be worth it to me if it would get me to my 340 gram target. If it can't, then I'm going to go with the thicker one because I'd rather have the better strength and the better three dimensional interface. Now, the trick here is going to be so this is going to be the, um, the piece that goes into these four slots on the end here. This is going to be our weights that go into there. Um, what I need to do now is duplicate this. What I need to do now is to, oh, I got rid of it. I got to grab it again. Derp. Uh, split. Split. No, I got to remake it because this one is, this one's scaled up. Um, this one is scaled up for tolerance so I actually have to remake the part out of this one okay so first thing we're going to do is split this and get rid of the wings that we don't need okay come on Split this one again. We're going to keep the chamfer. So that's going to help with printability and um, not requiring any kind of finishing or, or trimming the edges. So if you have a little too much elephant's foot, the bevel is going to prevent it from being too big to fit through the hole. So now, so as long as I do not change this here, okay? So whatever I do to this, as long as this part does not change at all, it will fit. And we have no holes. I have a couple errors there, but that's okay. Slicer will handle that. Um, so as long as, I do, as long as I do not change this base part, then the threaded part will fit perfectly onto this part. So what we do need to do, though, is we need to change the... Um, we need to cut a little deeper into this bevel here. Um, there's a couple different ways I can do that. If I take this and split it, um, see, so yeah, I want to keep that piece there so I can reapply a bevel. Okay. So let's hide that. Let's chop. We wanted a two millimeter deviation. We take this and make it two millimeters. And we chop two millimeters off of that. See this end I can change this here from this point, from this point right here to this point right here. As long as this and this length and shape does not change, then my parts will all go together correctly. 
And then we bring it back. And now I'm betting I could just bring this down two millimeters. Minus two. That should do it. So now I have a new beveled part and this two millimeter shorter. Why do I want it to be shorter? Because I'm going to put threads on top of that. And when I put the threads on top of that, I want the... um. Um, oh, no, that does create another problem. Oh, that does create another problem. We need this to be bigger. Mm, not good, not good, not good. Because the threads have to be smaller than the... Oh, I made this bigger, so it might be okay. Let's try putting threads on top and see what happens. Can't split that one. There's one I can split. Not there, not there. One of these can split. No. Uh, duplicate that. Bring it up. You asshole. I want you to just drag the part over, not be stupid. Okay, so we put a top here. Ooh, I gotta get going. The vegetable drop-off is happening. Well, this needs to go on top of here somehow. Up right about there. Let's center it on this. Okay. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this until it is even that, which is going to be pretty close to there. Um, I need to lift it a little more. I need to turn off my map grid. So I get a merge like that. Perfect. Now... Put a block on top of here. Seriously? Stop messing with me. Jesus. Okay. And we need to chop off the excess from this. That. There. Now that will interface. I don't need this to be this tall, but there's not much I can do about that. My cap should be long enough to be able to still push against the outside. Especially since I made this shorter. So now the, the threads, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep using the bottle threads because they're the right size. But yeah, see, the bottle threads are smaller than this cylinder, which means they'll fit through that hole. And that retains phase mode compatibility, so it still prints phase mode. And this is our interface to the actual unit itself. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. This won't work. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. This can't work. Um, it's bigger than 210. So I've got a, I've got to shorten this center one. Well, first I need that to be a cylinder. Let's get rid of this. Oh, I don't want you to do that. I want you just to pick the one fucking cylinder wall, you idiot. If I get rid of this, I don't need that anymore. I got to shorten this cylinder. I got to shorten the whole thing. Oh no. Because this is going to be bigger than 210 millimeters. Because th this is 210 millimeters. So these are going to have to get shortened. Oh, crap. Um, I guess I just need to figure out how much I need to shorten this. Um, hold on, stop messing with me. Okay, that is a good interface. 
Let's join these two together. Is there any way I can shorten that? I don't, I, can, I don't need this to be this long. Well, first things first, I can lop off some of this top. This top doesn't need to be this big. There. So I can lop that off. Okay. Oh, I don't want that to be all one piece. I want just this and this joined. Okay, so that takes off a little bit. Oh, I hate when it does that. Um... What else can I do? I can increase the number of threads and make this a bit stronger. That might not be a bad idea. But what I really want to do is get rid of some of this. I don't need all of this. Um, is it as simple as just put it on there? on. Got to keep getting in my way. Okay, so how much of this can I get rid of? I'd, I'd love to get rid of a lot. Oh, this is like good. Let's see what happens if I do that. Okay. Now I just need to bring this down to zero. Okay, I do need to fix this. I, I need an interface here. That's not going to do it. But I could maybe do that here. By shrinking this more. So we have an interface like that. That might work. What did you do? And why did you do it? Fuck! Oh! It's a separate part. I gotta hide this. It's this cylinder and this part. There we go. Okay, I think that worked. Okay. Let's join these together temporarily. Now we take. Oh, come on. Why did you do that? Why? Why are you going to mess with me? Why would you select all of them? Because you're an idiot. Always got to mess with me. <laughs> Control D. Flip it. Excuse me. Flip it. Then drop it to zero. Fusion sucks so bad. It, it, it's got issues. Um. It's proprietary. There's, they squeeze the free users more and more every year. To the point now where if you make any money at all, you're boned. If you make $1,000, you can't use them. But they charge $700 a year, which means if you make $1,000, you're just giving the money to Fusion. <laughs> so there, there's no middle ground for anybody in the middle. It's, it's crazy. You know, if this is thousand dollars in profit, I can get that. I can I can get behind that. But no, it's a thousand dollars in revenue.
Yeah, well, you make you make money doing it. I don't. So yeah, I get that. If you're making, obviously, if you're making, you know, a hundred grand a year doing CAD work, then that's nothing for you. I just wish they had a better middle ground. Okay, so I need to get rid of ten millimeters somehow. So in order to get rid of ten millimeters, I have to um, or well, this the you haven't. I don't know if you've seen this yet, Lightspeed. Um, but this is my modular dumbbell that theoretically can go from one to um, six pounds. The problem is, in order to modify this, while this makes it stupidly strong, like crazy strong, I have to take off 10 nuts in order to change anything. So what I'm doing now is making it lighter, and so it'll only have two nuts. And then you only have to take off two nuts and modify it any way you want. No, I'll see. Uh, if I'm making money using your software, I want to honor your license. Um, if I'm making money using Fusion, then I want to, I want to pay them. But um, what I want is I don't want to rent the software. That's why I'm actually looking at what's it called? Um, oh, I saved the video. There's a new CAD program that's um that um. That has um, all the features that I wanted. It seems like it has all the features that I wanted. And it's one price. You pay one price and you own the software. You get upgrades for a year. So you don't get any upgrades past that. But you own what you got. Um, I'll send you a link to the video so you can check it out. Um, like Simplify 3D. Yeah, exactly. I can keep using Simplify 3D. Even though they're not making any more updates anymore. I can keep using it. You didn't have to pay the $50 to upgrade it to um, 5.0. You could keep using four forever. And that's the model I prefer. Five was a substantial upgrade. One-time fee, you're now integrated into five. Good, you're done now. You don't have to pay anything ever again. You don't have to pay every month. You don't have to pay every year. If you stop paying 10 years from now, they don't turn off your software. I use it. I still, I have to. I'm trying to get away from Simplify 3D. I can't. Because there are things I can do in Simplify 3D I cannot do anywhere else. Even optimally printing this is impossible in any slicer except Simplify 3D. Because this part needs to be 0.2 millimeter layer thickness. This part needs to be 0.6 millimeter layer thickness. This part needs to be 0.8 millimeter layer thickness. This part needs to be 0.6. This part needs to be 0.2. You cannot do that in any slicer except Simplify 3D. Simplify 3D is the only slicer that will allow you to mix vase mode and non-vase mode. No, vase mode. Yes, if you're doing layers, then yes, you can do all of this. And it's not as easy, but you can do all of it in other sli slicers. But you can't do it with vase mode. <laughs> you, you have to go regular layer retraction, layer retraction, in order to do variable layer heights in... um in Prusa or Orca or anything else. You can create those blocks that allow you to create different settings and stuff like that, but you can't mix vase and regular. And that's why I still use Simplify 3D because it's, and also it's, it's slices are still superior to any other slicer. Can you get other slicers there? Yes, by manually tweaking what it's doing. I don't have to do that in Simplify 3D. It just does it itself. Now, yes, there are some times where it will do weird, funky things that um, piss me off, but that's usually because I'm bending the rules really hard. <laughs> and it's losing its shit when I bend those rules. But, um, but for the most part, I can set up a profile like that. I don't know, no tweaking. People, I, I hear people always talking about profiles, profiles, profiles. There's nothing in a profile. Nozzle diameter, bed size, vertical height. That's it. That's all there is in a profile. I don't change anything else in a profile. <laughs> and people think my profiles are magic. <laughs> no. Just Simplify 3D is good. <laughs> the, the company kind of sucks. And they're, they're in a pretty bad spot. No, now switch to regular. So 
print apart using three perimeters and whatever settings you want, and now switch to vase mode, and just try that. I sometimes go back and forth and switch back and forth. You know, this part will be perimeters, this part will be vase mode, this part will be perimeters. Like, for example, if, if I needed internal threads here, then this would have to be a multi-layer part. So this part here would be regular printing, meaning layers and retractions. This part here would be vase mode, and this part here would again be regular and retractions. You can't even put top layers on a vase mode print in Prusa Slicer. You could do bottom layers, but you can't do top layers. And God help you if you want to make the first layer 0.6 millimeters at 200% over extrusion, and then you want the next part of the model to be 0.2 millimeters with two perimeters, and then you want the next part of the model to be vase mode at 0.8 millimeter layer height. You can't do that in any other slicer. <laughs> yeah, basically, that's all. Direct driver or Bowden. Your retraction. You change the retraction. Or the temperature for the plastic. Otherwise... When I make a profile change, it has nothing to do with the printer. It has everything to do with what I'm printing. Like, those profile changes aren't because I changed from an Ender 3 to a, you know, uh, an, uh, a, a longer LK5 Pro. It's because I changed what I was printing. And so what I was printing had different requirements. And you can't create a profile for that. Because that profile will be unique for that print. <laughs> um... Prusa Slicer will not do it. You cannot do it in Prusa Slicer. It pops up a warning and says you cannot mix vase mode and regular mode. You have to pick one or the other. It won't let you even try. It, it, it straight up says no, you can't do this. You have to pick vase mode or regular mode. You cannot mix them. Go ahead and try it. Now, I haven't tried Orca Slicer. I haven't tried to see if that will let me do mixed vase mode. Um, hell, in Prusa Slicer, you can't even do variable vase mode. You can let it do variable vase mode, but you can't define it. At least I, well, I haven't tried really hard. Because usually I don't change, you know, the vase mode settings. It's usually intermixing between um, regular layer printing and vase mode printing, which I do a lot. <laughs> like the, the funnel that I print for the um, milk jugs. You know, I take an hour and a half off the print time by printing most of the funnel in vase mode, and then I do, you know, three perimeters to print the threaded part for the threaded cap to go in the milk jug. Just by switching the funnel part to vase mode, it took a lot longer to design, because I used my, my, my multi-surface complex vase mode technique. But, um, but the final print prints 90 minutes faster. <laughs> That's a lot of time. And saves a lot of plastic. You don't waste nearly so much plastic that way. Um... But yeah, you can't mix vase and regular. And it drives me nuts. It's like, why? Why can't you? It's just like, pretend that part of the print is zero millimeters and start a new process. It's not hard. That's exactly what Simplify 3D does. You know, and it shouldn't be that difficult. You know, you'll print the existing print. Now, pretend there's no print. Pretend where you're at now is the level of the bed. And now start a new print. Easy peasy. But, and that's, that's probably exactly what Simplify 3D does. Actually, Simplify 3D does, um, it intermixes. So it actually properly transitions from regular to vase and back to regular again. So when I tell it to print regular and then print vase, it actually prints the regular, prints a finished top layer, begins the initial squished bottom layer for the vase mode print, because the vase mode print doesn't start as a spiral. A vase mode print starts as one layer, and then it spirals off that one layer. Because if you started as an immediate spiral, by the time you got to the end of the first spiral, you'd be off the bed. So it, um... Oh, interesting. Now, that's a pain in the ass, but that is a workaround. Especially if I... If I, as I found out that um, Tinkercad will maintain origins. So, for example, if I were to leave this model as three pieces, and as long as I bring this model um, up to zero, so if I bring this model to zero, like that, um, I, can, I can save this as three separate pieces, and the origins will be retained. And I can then do align origins 
in Prusa Slicer, which I think works. I know it works in Simplified 3D. I'm assuming it works in Prusa, and it will put the parts in the right spot. Um, it's annoying because now you can't use sequential printing, or it gets difficult to use sequential printing because those origin points tend to get mixed up when you auto arrange, and you can't do that. So you can't use auto arrange, and you can't use um, linear placement. Um, you have to do it all manually because the auto placement and the align origins will conflict. I found out the hard way. <laughs> well, with Simplify 3D, I could just use multi process, and then I can duplicate that multi process and change the target to the second model. And I don't have to redo all my processes again. Um, so Simplify 3D has a workaround for that. It's not perfect. Their multi-process isn't perfect. But it's a hell of a lot better than Prusa and Cura. Where multi-process is a pain in the fucking ass. But interesting. I didn't know you could print separate bodies with different modes. So Prusa and, and, and Orca only prevent mode switching when you're using the same body. I'll have to play with that. Because I've, I've been seriously trying to get away from Simplify 3D, not because I don't like Simplify 3D. I, I, I prefer Simplify 3D. Simplify 3D is easier for me, so I'm going to keep using Simplify 3D. But I'm now making more models that other people have to print. And it is literally psychotic to expect somebody to go spend 200 bucks just to be able to print my models. So I have to make my models printable in, well, I chose Prusa Slicer because that's the most common, you know, free slicer available that doesn't suck. Cura sucks. Cura's, Cura's hot garbage. I don't care how much Ultimaker's improved it. And they have improved it a lot. It's still hot garbage. Um, <laughs> Prusa Slicer is light years ahead of um, Cura. Now, Orca Slicer might be a different story altogether. I haven't tried that yet. But I hear you like it. I hear, I hear you, know, you seem to say there's a lot of good things about it. So let's see. We are at 225.36 millimeters. I'm going to forget about the 0.36. I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I can just ignore that. How the hell is it 0.36? Where do you get a 0.36? How does that even happen? Like, seriously? 0.36. I need to get rid of it. It's going to cause me problems. Okay. So. So I need to, if I just drop this down 0.36. Negative 0 0.36. Oh, got to be half that. 18, 1, 8. Because both will be 0.18 shorter. There. Oh yeah, 27.5. So it makes it an even number. Okay. Makes sense. It's annoying, but whatever. Control D. Rotate 180. Drop it down to zero. Uh, no, not to zero. I gotta drop it in the right spot. Gotta drop it to that zero. Ah, uh, come on. Why do you got to put it off the screen? Some things it does so right, and some things are so annoying. Like it, it's just little idiosyncrasies that just drive you crazy. I need, I need the other one. See, I, need, I need this one down here. But it was off the screen. Okay, now, how tall are we? See, if I didn't get rid of that now, it'd come back to bite me in the ass later. I need to take off 15 millimeters. So if I want to take off 15 millimeters from this one, I have to take off 15 millimeters from this one. So if I take this and make it um, 155, is that right? Yes. And then take 15 millimeters off this one, 155. There. I have to keep the relationship. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot to switch screens again. I have to keep the relationship between these two parts identical so that when they are inserted into this, they all meet at the same point. Otherwise, this plate will end up getting bent one way or another. It'll either get bent this way because the 
uh, center ones too short, or it won't compress the outside ones because the um, um, in fact, it might actually be beneficial to make this one millimeter bigger than this. Which I can't do, so I'd have to make this one millimeter shorter. Because that will actually compress ore on the outside. Um, I don't necessarily need that though, but I'm going to do it anyway. One millimeter, so we're going to go 154. That will mean the center one will compress slightly more, half a millimeter more on each side, which will help it squish those outer four a little bit better. This way, um, they will all meet at the same point, but no part will be bigger than 210 millimeters. I have a 210 millimeter restriction because Prusa, um, Prusa printers have a 210 millimeter vertical limit. Now, an ender could handle it, but um, I want everybody to be able to print it, at least as many people as feasible. So now I just bring these down. Since I didn't modify these, we're good. Now this should be 210. No, it's 195. Why the hell is it 195? Because this needs to be 210. Duh. This needs to be 210. And we are 209. That's good. That's fine. Okay. Well, because this. So now I have my center post with threads. I have my four outer bodies with um, um, the slip fit slotted joints. I have my slotted joints here correctly oversized so the parts should slip together. I'm a little bit worried about, um, I only have a half a millimeter of tolerance and I'm a little bit worried about um, um, uh, ringing. I'm worried about ringing on the corners, making these slots too big to fit here. Um, you know what I could do? I should have done this to begin with. In theory, it should print okay. Yeah, that shouldn't affect the printability. Okay, what I can do... Yeah, that actually should work. Let's try it. Hi, baby. Um, the, this, this is an interesting little Tinkercad trick for you guys. Um, so this is 2.1 millimeters wide. That is because the nozzle is one millimeter. And so you need one millimeter on each side, plus a little wiggle room, so that it can make the 90 degree turn um, in order to print this um, fin. If it was less than two millimeters, it would have to use variable width to try to simulate it and print it, and that can cause issues. Um, you guys can see this, right? Yes. Um, now, what I can do, this, I don't know if this is going to work. We're going to have to test it in the slicer. <coughs> the slicer may or may not like this. But what I can do is I can round the edge of this. I can make the edge of this round. And, um... So we'll take this, let's go to this side. Yep, there it is. And expose it again. I'll save these for later. That is for elephant's foot to make sure it can insert without a problem. Why won't you move? I hate that graduated movement. I hate it so much. Okay, so what we do is we take this half shell here and Two point one one. Okay, we make it uh, like one millimeter this way. Yes. All right. Stand it up. Bring it this way. Bring it up to zero. Okay. Basically, we're going to insert it even with this. That's one millimeter. 
which means I need to make this one millimeter smaller. 39. And then I take this end, make it 38. Then we take this and we align it with this. Line, fix here, do here. Um, then to here. Oh, I forgot about that shift. That's annoying. Okay, so it's going to be easier to do that. So, now, align these two pieces. That and that. Not all the fucking pieces, you dumbass. Line it to the end, the center. And now, I shorten this. 39... And 38. There. Now I have a rounded edge like that. I'm going to duplicate this. Oh, I can't do that yet. Uh, that, won't, that won't work. Yes, it will. Um, control D. Join it with this. And now I'm going to select this piece as well. Since I need one piece that's as wide as everything. So I can properly rotate this. And there. Now, why didn't that work? It didn't rotate properly. Why didn't it rotate properly? I chose it. Wait a minute. Oh, this is separate pieces. I never joined these. These need to be joined. That was my fault. Now if I select this and this... It'll rotate on the center of the bigger piece. And now I'm in position to join to this one. Easy peasy, yummy squeezy. And yep, that is correct. Now, we bring back our hidden cuts. And we join them with this. That gets us our elephant's foot buffer. We delete this one, duplicate this one, rotate it one. 90 degree turn. There. Now we have our veins with a rounded edge. Um, hopefully the rounded edge is small enough not to confuse the slicer. You know, because this is this is just the right size for the nozzle so that it won't have the ringing. Because um, if the ringing is too much, it's going to have a problem going into the slot. Even though I made the slot bigger to account for that, um, if the ringing is too much, it'll <coughs> it'll bulge out the end of the fin. Usually, rounding the edge of the fin is enough to stop it from doing that. Usually, not always. Usually, okay. Now we join. Of course. See, you want to grab all the other fucking pieces too, you asshole. And now we get rid of this one and replace it with this one. Okay. And you here. And drop you down to zero. There. Now we have pretty optimized parts that will hopefully not have too much ringing. They are completely vase mode compatible. Chamfers should make for easy insertion. I have a half a millimeter tolerance on the slots here. That should be enough. I have 0.2 millimeter tolerance for the chamfer. And I have a half a millimeter tolerance for the, um, the fins. Because the chamfer will just sit proud if it's not quite right. So it's fine. Um, uh, well, it's not really an interesting design to make fly. Adding a few more of these veins might look interesting as an engine nozzle. Actually, that would look pretty good. For like a V2-style rocket. Yeah, that would actually look kind of neat. If I were to do something like... Take these. Control D. Rotate them like that. Yeah. That would look pretty slick as the ass end of a rocket. And then have like some... 
little 50 style curvy fins here like a radiator grill rocket nozzle that would actually look kind of neat i just i just, yeah, i just might have to make a rocket based on that <laughs> yeah i just might have to turn that into a rocket because that was that's kind of neat Let me join you. Okay. All right, let's work on the cap. I think the only thing I wanted to do was to shave down the outside a little bit. Where is it? Why didn't that work? Oh, okay, just make a cylinder. Here we go. Make it a hole, make it bigger, increase the number of sides. Okay. I wanted to flatten out these um, knurling a little bit. Just because I don't need to be quite that proud. And now I just universally shrink all three dimensions until it starts cutting it. There we go. That looks pretty good. You're not going to get a whole lot of detail with a one millimeter nozzle there, so make it a little, a little better. There we go. Really, you had to shift all my parts, didn't you? There, there, and now join. There. Now our, we have a knurling pattern, but it's a little smoother, so it shouldn't be as sharp against the fingers, but it still should provide a grip. We have our chamfer for our base layer, and we are good. I might actually be able to shorten this cap. This cap might not need to be this big. So I might be able to shave a couple grams off, but for now, we're going to leave it alone. Okay, let's, let's shift these, although I already screwed up and... Made it impossible to ever go back. So, goodbye. <laughs> that model is now a fixed design. It's It would be very hard to change that now. Seriously? Because I deleted the dog bone. At least the editable dog bone. I no longer have an editable version of that dog bone. That over there. So that's the old models. These are the new models. Where's my new model? Uh, hello. Where the hell's my new model? Oh, that's it right there. This is the model. Uh, this one I don't need. This is my cut tool that I oversized for making the cuts in here. Um, I did want to, I did want to modify this cap a tiny bit. Um, yeah, I want to shave out a little bit of that. It's just a little too square. Um, let's drop a cylinder in here. At least the sides. Really? You gonna fuck with me like that? Asshole. Center, center. And let's scale until we chop away a little bit of the threads. Just a little bit. Oh, seriously? Why'd you do that? Why? It was perfect. I hate when it does that. Is that too much? That might be too much. Why is it attached? I'm not touching the mouse buttons, and it's attached. It's because of this menu. It's because this goddamn menu appeared. That's what did it. Oh, my God. Okay. Just by squaring off the edge of those threads just a tiny bit. Um... It should make them a little bit less sloppy on the inside. 
and it should also um, make them thread on just a tiny bit easier. So it won't be so hard for people to thread it. But it shouldn't take away. See how now it's got a little flat edge? That should help with printability a little bit. Yeah. It should be okay. Okay. So, um, let's join these together. Let's check for errors. We got some slight errors at the interface here, but that's nothing the slicer can't handle. There's no gaping holes. That's all I really care about. Check this one. Looks good. Again, slight interface errors, but no gaping holes. Check the dog bone. Uh, that's perfect. Clean, no errors. And yeah, well, actually, that's pretty clean. Hard to check, but it looks clean. Looks like I got rid of all the rough edges that would normally cause a problem. See, if there's any holes in the model, you'll actually see it as a cavity in here. Actually, pretty effective. Why? Why do you keep bringing that up? Like, I don't want that. Whatever that is, I don't want it. It's like, go away, punk, pest, annoying pestilence. Okay. Oh, one thing I didn't check. Um. Oh, that's kind of important. We need to know that. Um, this here. I need to bring this down to here. Okay. And then bring this over to here. Ooh, that's not enough. That's no good. That needs to be bigger. This needs to be, this needs to stick out a whole lot more. That's not going to work. I forgot I increased this to um, um twenty millimeters. Yep, that's something I needed to check. That will not fly. And it's going to be even worse than that because you're not going to get a perfect mate like this. I need more thread sticking out. There's no way that's going to work. It'll just tear the threads. Well, actually, that shouldn't be a problem. Just however much I have to extend this, I have to shorten this. As long as I don't change the relationship between them. Um, basically, um, the position of these end caps cannot change. So, th this section right here, this section right here cannot change. So, let's do it again. Let's, what the fuck is that? Go with this white. Okay, so in this here, all right, I can only change this. So this here, I cannot change. I cannot change it, and I cannot move it. This cannot change, this cannot move. If I move this, I have to move these as well. which is going to make these smaller, which means they're going to hold less sand, which means they're going to be further away from a pound. I'm already off by 3%. Okay, so what I have to do is... This has to stay in the same position. Otherwise, these won't line up. I can't make them taller, because then it won't be printable. On printers with a 210 millimeter limit. So I need to lower these pieces inward. 
to create more threads. Um, three millimeters will probably be enough. So if I lower this, minus three, and I shorten this by three, one, five, one, I'll do the same thing on the other side. Um, now the threads stick out further. And instead of, um, well, actually, it wouldn't help at all to do that, so I'm just going to put a cylinder in here. I don't know exactly how big that is. Come on. Okay. Take this and this, line it on this piece. Fucking whore. Something's causing it to go off of the red dot, which causes it to deselect what I'm doing, which causes me to be a very angry critter. Um, piece of sides. Now we do a universal scale until we are just a hair bigger. To guarantee we have an overlap. Sink the part in. Shrink this down so it's inside the white tube here and there. That is now going to be proud three millimeters. Or do I have to be five? I think I have to be five. I don't think three is enough. It's the total width of the whole thing. Let's try it because it's very easy to change if I want to. All I got to do is shorten both of these by the same amount and very easy to go and make that change. Okay. So now I need to... Come on. Meet you. Um, maybe all the way down here. We gotta go to 148, 148. Go up, zero. All right, that should do it. I did not change the position or relationship of the shoulders. Wait a minute. Yes, I did. I made it three, I made it six millimeters shorter. So I have to make this one six millimeters shorter too. Um, one, four. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 149 because it's one millimeter taller. Okay. And this has to also go down six. Why are you messing with me? Oh, it's five. Oh, you're messing with me. Why are you messing with me? What's the problem? One forty nine. What was it? Okay, there we go. 155, 149, and 6 millimeters. 
don't know why that relationship changed. It shouldn't have. There we go. <sighs> now, we test fit. Come on, get out of my way. It's going to fit like that. And is that enough threads? I don't think it is. I think I need the full five. Yeah, I need the full five. Okay. I'm going to delete you. I'm going to split you up back into your parts. I'm blue, so I can see the difference. So, I need to lower this two more millimeters. Or one, four, six. And then lower this two millimeters. Why would you do that? Oh, it's a negative number. I thought it was relative. Okay. That is this new shape, which is... Joined. Oh, I think I screwed this up too. I got to shorten on both ends. Um, yeah, I only did it six. Oh, because this is a unified shape. I did three and three. Um, this one, on the other hand, has to be shrunken on both ends. Um, so two more. To make it one for four. I think I, fuck, I think I fucked up something. Um, did I make this three and three last time? It was 210 and 195. There was a 15 millimeter difference between them. So now there needs to be a 20 millimeter difference between them. And there is. 189, 209. Yes, we're good. Hold D, 180. All the way down to here. Make the zero plane here. Grab this part, bring it to zero. Okay. Now we should have enough the threads to engage. That is going to make the weights a little lighter, though. Check it. Come on. Give me the goddamn pull. You son of a bitch. It won't give me the fucking pull. It wants me to rotate this way. But if I rotate this way, I can't see it. Close. And that is proud enough. Okay. That'll work. All right, let's zero everything out. Everything 
everything is sitting on the work plane. Nothing funky happens in the slicer. All right, so now I need to print four of these, two of these, two of these, and two of these. <coughs> All right, let's call this center export <coughs> center. And this we're going to call outer port CO. This will just be called cap. Sports and dog bone. Sport STL. Okay. So we are going to go from five, six, seven. We're going to go down to eight parts from. 14 parts. No, 10, 11, 12, 15, 17. So we're going to go from 17 parts to 8 parts. I call that a win. <laughs> um, let's see what the slicer looks like. Just nice. Uh, I already have profiles set up for all this. Here's the parts. Um... Well, I better keep all that. Okay, so let's get my profiles going. That is for the outer. That. Take our new outer. Memory card set up. Need to use an extension because I'm using the USB port for something else. So we need to take this, plug it into this, and plug this, this. Now I can plug it into a USB C port. Go. So slice. Looks good. Two hours, 29 minutes. That's at a thick layer height. Oh, uh, no. I can, let's see if I can do variable layer. How do you do variable layer in... Because if I can make this a much thicker layer height, that would work a lot better. Uh, phase mode. Point two, point layer height. Uh, four bottom solid layers. We will change the min-max. Um, to 0 0.8. Um, now, how do you use variable layer height? Advanced scene position, perimeters, how to do variable layer height? I know it has it. I've seen it. I don't know how to do it, though. I think it's the difference between that Arachne and the new slicing engine does the variable width. Um, so Arachne, or the classic and Arachne, I think that's the difference. But how do you define it? Um, I, I, I don't care. I don't care. I'm just going to print the goddamn thing. And past the point of caring right now, I'll figure it out later. I just want to get it going. Okay, everything looks good. All right. Export G code. We're going to export to... This is going to be called outer. Okay. 
Okay. Now the let's save the profile with the new file. Now all I gotta do is delete this and install the inner. Get the same result. That is going to be the center. That's going to use the same profile. Okay. Make sure we don't have any weird gaps or anything. That all looks good. Now the threads are nice and clean. No holes or gaps. That took a while to do. Uh, inner. What is your problem? You don't want to read the goddamn file? Screw you. Just do what I said. What the fuck does a cycle error? What the fuck is your problem? Do what I say. I don't think it likes this adapter. Get in the slot. Okay. That worked. All right. Recent projects. Uh, cap. Just go away. Stop agitating me. Delete the old cap. New cap. Nice. Yeah, it was a little bit cleaner. Not by much, though. That is borderline. That's a really... You know, the way it's all broken up there. It should not be doing that. It's okay. Actually, I wonder if I... No, I'd rather have the two walls. I don't like the way that's printing, though. Or whatever. That's why it's so sloppy. Wait a minute. Two. Full CV. Auto range. Yep, we need two caps. Anything else? Um, yeah, we only need two. Is it just me or did it shorten those caps? It did. Why did it shorten them? Oh, it, it finished slicing. Oh, the preview. The preview was... Okay. It was just the preview. Caps. Why do I have to keep unplugging it and plugging it back in to get this damn thing to work? I don't, I don't understand that. It has something to do with the C the adapter. I'm gonna do the adapter. It's causing it to um not be able to write to the SD card properly. It's weird. Okay, save project. Alright, recent projects, wishbone. Eat the wishbone. Re-add the wishbone, dog bone. Roll, CV, auto arrange. That is the new one. No extreme angles. Okay. What we are gonna do though is lower the amount of infill. I found out I, you can't change infill settings unless you have bottom layers. You have to have a bottom layer in order to change infill. I don't know why. You just do. See, I got infill here. Watch if I change my bottom layer to zero. 
Oh, now it's let me change infill. Before, it wouldn't let me change the infill until I gave it a uh, bottom layer. Huh. Let's try um, 8%. So actually, let's try 6%. And see what that looks like. Ah. You hurt your ear, baby? I don't know if that's too loose or not. It does bring it down to only 226 grams. So I only added um, 36 grams, making them 30% um, thicker. That's not bad. I went from 90 to 112. 22 grams extra each. Not bad. But is that enough infill? I think it is. Especially at this thickness. I think it will be. We're going to go with it. It only takes six hours. Nice. I am broke. Yeah, cyclical error again. It's like it refuses to stay connected. Here we go. That's all the parts. Save project. So we have the 3MF file saved. All right. That's it. I will now print the parts. And um, YouTube is not receiving. What? Are we not streaming anymore? Enough video to maintain smooth free. It's fine. YouTube's just bitching about anything. If I just give it some stuff to see, that'll increase the bitrate enough. To... <laughs> it's because I wasn't moving very much. Um, that's it. I'm going to print out the new part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep both sets of parts. I'm going to release this as a set. They're, they're both going to come in the same package. Um, you get one, you get both. Whether you pay or get it for free. Um... You print this set if you don't mind struggling with caps and stuff to reassemble it, but you want something that's truly like bulletproof, like you can really beat the hell out of this and probably not break it. Um, the only concern is these, um, but they are strong. Um, obviously, if you hit a sharp edge, it's probably going to crack one. But um, in general, that's also why I made the wishbones a little bit bigger, the dog bones. So that it'll act as a bumper to protect the weight tubes. So if you don't mind printing a little bit more plastic and a little bit more work to have to screw all these things in, especially because most people, they're probably going to, if you're in relatively decent shape, you're probably going to fill all of them. Use it as a five-pound, six-pound dumbbell. Probably never going to take it apart again, um, but you can. Um... You'll be able to print this, the beefed up version. That assuming it works right, I'm going to start printing the parts. Oh my god. Assuming it starts, <coughs> assuming it prints correctly, you'll also have the efficient version that uses less plastic to print. I'll showcase that next week when um, I have it all done. Because I got about um, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 18, 20 hours worth of printing. So 20 hours worth of printing, so probably three days. Um, I'll print up all the parts and we'll put together the new version and see how well that goes together and go from there. I got an idea for strengthening up the center tube by, um, um, I could put little slots in the tube with zero dimension. So it'll, it'll be like printing my, um, base mode prints with the little stub that connect the inside and the outside walls. Except this just won't have a separate inside wall. It'll just have those veins. And I can make those veins a spiral. Like I did with this. I can't get it out, but like I did with the rocket, the spiral veins inside. And that'll help stiffen up that center tube a little bit. Um, I might do that just to, just to, because I can squeeze that center tube. But in reality, once you fill that with sand, you'd have to squeeze that pretty damn hard to break it. 
most people probably can't squeeze hard enough to break that. And I don't have to worry about impact because, well, well that's protected by all this. So what's going to hit that one? So I might not bother, but um, maybe I will make a beefed up version if you really want to beef it up. Hey, um, if you want a heavier model, maybe I'll make the center one with the bulbous shape, which will make it both stronger and it'll hold more weight. But as long as your hands are small enough to get in there, my hands are big. So my hands would bump into the other tubes when I did that. But um, yeah, so I will get this. I'm going to get this online so people can start printing it out because this is fine. This is ready to go like it is. Um, I'll, I got to do up instructions because if you're not printing vase mode with a one millimeter nozzle, then you need instructions <laughs> of how to print this. Most of it is basically just print free perimeters. Um, if you tell it, if you tell your slicer to extrude 0.5 millimeter, then you can just do two perimeters. But you, it's going to take a little bit more plastic, but you're probably better off just doing three. Because the, the little bit of the 0.2 millimeters extra plastic will make up for the weaker um, perimeter style um, printing. So basically just all these... Three perimeters, zero percent infill. Um, this one caps three perimeters. The dog bone, you're gonna do um, the three millimeters thickness. So four, eight, twelve. You need seven perimeters. So the dog bone, with the, this is if you're using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, you use seven or eight perimeters. And you'll probably have to use at least 20, 25 percent infill. You want a pretty tight grid like this. You're not going to, you're going to want tighter than this because each of my infills one millimeter thick. Each of yours is going to be 0.4. Although, you can tell your slicer to extrude thicker infill. And you might want to do that. As long as you slow down, because if you try to extrude one millimeter out of a 0.4 millimeter nozzle going 60 millimeters per second, you're going to have a bad day. It's not going to work. You're going to have to slow down to like 15 or 20 millimeters a second. But you should be able to tell your slicer to extrude like a 0.8 millimeter or one, even a 1 millimeter. You might be able to get away with but both 0.8 if you have a 0.4 nozzle. Tell it to extrude your infill at 0.8. You want that thicker infill. Um, so um, 7 perimeters. Um, you know, 10 to 20% infill depending on how thick you can make it extrude. The thinner your infill, the more percent infill you want. Um, but you need those seven walls because you need that strength. Um, but yeah, you do that. It should take about half a roll of plastic. You'll end up with one of these. Um, eventually, I'll have pre-sliced G-code. I'll design it for a 200, 200, 200 bed. This way, you can put it on your Prusa. You can put it on your Ender. You can put it on your CR-10. It won't care. All the parts are less than 200 millimeters. Um, except for the height, 210, which anything 209, which anything including Prusa can print. So I'll have pre-sliced G-code for all that. Um, for Prusa Slicer, I'll have free MF files. Play around with it and whatnot. But yeah, that should work. And I will also test print it with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. See how well it comes out. Oh, my God. Oh. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you once again to Colin for that donation. I really appreciated that. I will see you guys next week.